but they also wanted to know, you know, high input costs, where can we save money this year? Um, what's the implication of a frost of crop and that sort of thing? So, um, Look, stop my screens. All right, here we go. So, at the end of the day, I put together a list of aims that I wanted to get across to you guys. One was to keep frost minimization on the agenda. Um, just to, is it very easy to roll into next year and forget about last year, especially in other areas of the state where they didn't get belted last year? Um, I imagine for a lot of you guys, it's still scarred and fresh on your mind. Uh, what could have been? Um, we want, I want to give you guys some tips on growing a profitable crop for the coming year and to give you tools and ideas you can take home and adopt now for the coming season to minimise your business exposure to frost next year and the year after. And, and also some decisions um, from after frost to make sure that you don't get a carryover effect of um, the frost last year hurting your decision-making process for this year. So that's what I, I felt are the key aims of this present. General outline, I'm gonna tell you guys how to frost a wheat crop going to do a bit of a definition of what is a frost and under what conditions do we get the damage? Why are we seeing more frost damage these days than we used to? Um, I've penciled in a couple of five-minute breaks if you need a toilet stop or a quick cuppa. Uh, and at the time, we can decide if you want to keep on rolling or if you want a little break. And uh, then I thought I'd go and dig in a bit deeper in what happened in 2021 and opportunity for you guys to share your experiences and some of the lessons you've learned. Um, crop nutrition after frost. Um, and a bit about gaining control, you know, often after you've been belted by frost, you think, shit, I've got, there's nothing I can do. What am I going to do? Just do it all the same and just see what happens. And there's some strategies you can take to get some control back. And, and as long as you're aware of the risks and, and what you may be trading off, but yeah, gaining control, knowing your risk, and then some, some, some tips and tactics for um, this season. So that's the outline of the, the session. Um, I need to acknowledge I'm the mouthpiece today. Um, as an agronomist, I'm not a, I, I do research, but I'm not a professional researcher. I'm a professional agronomist with a, with a side interest in research. So I'm very good at stealing other people's work. And often through my interest in frost, we've been involved in a national frost initiative with a lot of uh, high, more qualified scientists than I am. And I'm just really acknowledging, I may not all the way through this preso, I acknowledge everybody's work and bits we've stolen, but you know, it's been a lot of work with Ben Bidoff and his team Brendan Lesky and, and crew from Deep Herd. Um, Consul Ag's done a lot of trial work over the years. Other members within Consul Ag, Living Farms, got some stuff with UWA, CSPP, and the Grower Group Alliance. So I just wanted to upfront acknowledge um, this isn't all my wisdom. At, um, and a lot of the frost work that's happened across the state in the last few years has been very collaborative and been a really good model through the National Frost Initiative. And I just wanted to acknowledge that it, it's not all my wisdom, it's lots of lots of red wines and lots of discussion sessions with other researchers to try and develop these strategies for you guys. So, yeah, just wanted to acknowledge that up front. I thought I'd start with how to frost a wheat crop. <clears throat> and I know this photo here, Doug, isn't your low-lying flat paddock. It's a bit different colour. Um, but really, if you want to go about frosting a wheat crop, I've got pretty good at it. And, um, and a lot of my clients have as well, unfortunately. But... Generally, a sandy surface soil type is going to get frosted easier than a good red loam. But if you ignore the sandy surface part, you know, the soil types lower in the landscape are regularly hit more often. Uh, and if it's a bit lighter in colour, that, that um, doesn't help. <clears throat> lower K levels increases your frost risk. And often a high, anecdotally, we often see a high end background or maybe it's just to remember the scars more. But, you know, if you had a really good pulse crop uh, at your way, it could be a manipulated medic or a good good legume base, often those crops that look awesome end up being the worst smoked. And generally we'd sow something like Vixen, quick short season variety, used to be wild catcher a few years back, but you know, Vixen's definitely the, been the highest yielding variety in the NVT for, for a couple of years now. And you know, sold it the 25th of May, it, it'll outbeat all the long ones easily. So, we, but, but being farmers, being farmers, we're gonna whack it in the 10th of May, um, find the shortest week we can and put it in early. Give it a good seed rate because we're pretty confident. Got some moisture at the start of May for a change. Maybe sneak on a bit more pea because it wasn't that dear last year. Might be hard to justify this year, but last year it was easy to go and get another truckload. And we use a good, good dose of upfront end, so we grow a big bulky canopy. And then we would get excited by the year, so we pump it up a bit more. Um, thinking 
might be uh, coming in above average, two tonne plus. Um, certainly heard in your patch this year that some of the unfrosted crops are going well over three, which is pretty exciting, um, but end up falling way short of that in the worst case scenario in the, in the, in the early crops or the lower lying parts of paddocks or, or even whole paddocks. Um, and we've been able to achieve that. This is one of our frost trials from a few years ago and, and we, it was, we, we got too good at it and that site got completely smoked so it was very hard to get any data out of it. And Ben Biddeff often describes, you know, the challenge with picking a frost site is it's a bit like trying to breed salt tolerant wheat. You don't start in the middle of the salt lake because nothing's going to live. You go on the edge where the salt's marginal and try and pick up some differences and that's what we've had to do with our frost trial sites is not go to the worst spot because if everything gets smoked, you want to be on the shoulder where you just get touched up and you can tease out some differences. So um, how's that go with you, Doug? Is that a bit too familiar? Yep, seen a lot of that, yep. 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 Um, I thought I'd give a bit of a definition of what is a frost. Um, and you know, a, when there's been an event, there's a lot of different temperatures pinging around all over the place because a lot more people have on-farm monitoring equipment so they can me they're measuring now. Um, but an official, officially a frost is when the screen temperature drops below two degrees. Remembering that's in a Stevenson screen. So that's a thermometer in a white box, um, not a, a metal button uh, exposed to moisture and, and ice. Um, but regularly, so that's a Stevenson screen there, thermometer inside the white box. It lets a um, little bit of air flow through. Um, that improves the accuracy during the day. But on average, it's about two, two and a half degrees colder than the soil surface. So if you had a thermometer on, on the ground or a crop height, whatever the surface is, it's usually one or two degrees. Um, so about two, two and a half degrees warmer inside that white box. So often two, two in a, in a uh, proper weather station might be zero at ground level. So an official weather station, at two is, is a, a frost event. The key factors leading to damage, because we know we get plenty of frost all the time, but when's it gonna hurt us? When's it gonna cost us money? And the big one is a crop development stage, um, having crops at the right stage. Crops can tolerate a fair bit of frost uh, during the vegetative phase and, and cold weather, but it's at the later stages when damage occurs. And we'll go into that in more detail. Obviously the duration, um, we've seen in our frost trials over the years, plenty of times we've had all the conditions leading up to a frost, uh, really cold in the afternoon, wind stops, bit of drizzle comes in. And then about midnight, just before it gets really icy, in comes a band of cloud and we'll see the temperatures run up by one or two degrees. So regularly, uh, to get that severe damage, it's got to be a long time. Um, and <clears throat> the other side of it is the position of the landscape. So the cold air does drain uh, and it flows down. And you guys who are moving sheep late in the evening or on a motorbike or going for a run, you'll really feel those cold air streams um, on those nights where there's little hot pockets of air and cold air, you can feel it on your face. But that lower lying part, it just accumulates the cold air. Uh, the soil types, we get more damage on the lighter textured soils or soils that haven't been able to hold heat. And leading into frost, the damaging frost, we, we never get a frost when there's air movement. So if we've got a bit of breeze uh, going, it might be super cold, might have a massive wind chill, but we don't get that um, ice freezing. And the real kicker, uh, and I believe you guys experienced it last year, was that late little drizzle uh, late in the afternoon. Usually, you know, there's a front forecast uh, and we're going to get 10 mil out of it. Um, blows his guts out all day. Um, about four or five o'clock, you, you squeak, you ring out about one and a half mil out of the clouds and then the wind stops and your sun's going down. You think, shit, it's cold, we're in trouble here. And the crops have got a little bit of wet on the leaves. Um, and that's really the precursor to, to getting that severe damage. So the crop at the right time heading to head emergence and, and that drizzle and those same conditions. Um, I'm going to digress a little bit. Um, we've always talked about that late drizzle and its impact. And we've said, well, the, often we get more stem frost following um, a frost event with the rain. Um, and we always, always said, oh, well, it's the little drip of water around the collar of the leaf that then freezes a ring and does the stem damage. But some new work by Ben and his team um, has added to that. So basically, it's a farmer called John Hicks from Pingarup, uh, Paul Hicks's father, who 
has been on to the frost research team and GRDC for a long time to investigate ice nucleating bacteria. And these are natural bacteria that are present in the landscape, um, the pr present in the atmosphere, um, and they're little bacteria that help rain droplets form. So to form a rain droplet in the cloud, you need a dust particle or particle or something for the drops to accumulate on. Um, and they play that role of um, forming droplets in the sky. When you get one or two mil of rain, the concentration of these bacteria is very high. When you get 10 mil of rain, they're diluted with big raindrops and they have no impact. But when we get these light rain events, effectively the crops get covered with this bacteria that lowers the freezing temperature. So think of an antifreeze, which may, means it freezes harder or radiator coolant. These bacteria do the opposite and they trigger ice to form earlier at a warmer temperature. Does that make sense? Um, and these crops are getting plastered from head to toe with bacteria that uh, want the crop to get ice damage. Because when you damage the cells in the wheat, the sugars come out and they get a feed. Um, so, and these bacteria have been known for a long time in horticulture. And Ben, the last couple of years, has done some surveys collecting rainfall or having growers collect rainfall. And he's been able to demonstrate that these low rainfall events can carry ice nucleation. And he's done a fair bit of field work and lab work. And when I say Ben, Ben and his team. Um, and they're also finding that when they spray it on, they can also induce more damage. So this is kind of a, a new watch this space, but it helps to explain why in some events, we don't see the traditional valley floor type thing where it can happen on top of a hill and other parts of the landscape. So, um, and Ben's been leading the charge on this work, but these days it's picked up by, been picked up by Brenton Lisky and Emmanuel as well. So watch your space and hopefully we can um, come up with some better solutions going forward for that. So the other part of managing frost is a bit of a balancing act. Um, the soil plays a role in holding heat so the soil is a, has a heat reserve and it radiates that heat out at night and during the day it takes up that heat. Um, so it's got a soil heat bank. Just like when you guys go to the beach in January, 40 degree day, the white sand is stinking hot on top. If you wiggle your feet underneath, it's cool underneath. So that white sand reflects a lot of heat. The surface gets hot, but it doesn't conduct down. Whereas the more loamy soils are able to conduct that heat and and uh, deeper into the soil and then have more heat to give, give it back out. Um, some of our trial work, what we're seeing on the white sands is they let the heat out, but by, by midnight, um, there's no more warmth left in the white sands. So here's some photos using a um, heat camera, thermal image, and you can see here the purple is the crop. So these are air seeder rows. Those three lines are rows of crop. And this is the hump of dirt on the interrow here and here. And then this is the greater soil mass. So you can see that the hump of dirt on the interrow has warmed up and, is, and has heat there to radiate out. Here's another photo um, taken by Steve Curtin from Consult Ag. So we've got these little uh, MDF strips on a wooden stake. Um, and then coming back late at night during a frost event to see where the temperature is. And you can see this is the crop rows, the purple but you can see the temperature effect, how higher in the canopy is a lot colder and you can see the heat coming out of the soil surface. So that's kind of what's going on within the canopy. But why are we getting more frost damage? One, we're getting more frost and they're getting colder and I'll touch on that shortly. We have more crop and a higher yield potential. So the wheat belt, um, no surprise to all of you that everybody's running less sheep and we've got good at sowing a whole crop earlier and we're planting more of the landscape. So when there is a frost event, um, every business is getting a bigger hit from that. Um, we've got less diversity. So um, any farmers on the line there? You there, Doug? Yes, mate, yep. Yep, wonder if you want to touch on yeah, how many wheat varieties do you think growers have out in your area? Oh, I would have said most guys have three. Three? Yep. 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 Um, I've got a few more, but it doesn't didn't seem to manage matter last year. But yes, yeah. yeah. And you know, big parts of the state, if you do a swab from Gerald and Esperance, big parts of the state 
Um, you know, growers are running one, maybe two wheat varieties, um, one on the way out, one on the way in, and they want to. You know, I know when I first started, lots of my clients had three wheat varieties and one barley variety, and since then, a lot of their farms have tripled, and they want to have less varieties than they did when they had a smaller farm. So, so across the landscape, we're seeing less diversity, um, <clears throat> and all our varieties a shorter season. Um, the, the ones being pushed, the ones that win the uh, NVT system are these shorter season varieties. So we're losing that diversity um, in our system. You know, we used to have varieties like Spear, Stiletto, Cam. Um, we do have Cutlass now that fits that window, but generally the adoption of those varieties is nowhere near as great as it used to be. So we've got to really question our system. We've got a farming enterprise. We're putting more crop in, we're sowing it earlier, and we're sowing it with shorter season varieties and not the diversity that we used to have. Here's some deep herd generated data on frost events. The map on the left hand side shows the average frost occurrence, so it's below two degrees from 1975 to 1999. And then the next one shows the next um, 20 year period from 2000 to 2020. And you can really see the frequency of these um, colder events has increased in, in the recent 20 years. On top of that, we've got a uh, warming climate as well. So um, <clears throat> this, this chart shows the increase in heat. Um, so it is the days above 30 degrees that seem to generate heat stress. So we've got 1975 to 1999 and then 2000 to 2020. So what we're seeing here is in the last 20 years, we've got more warm events um, above 30 than we used to get. Interestingly, the impact of the frost, the more frost is covering a bigger area and moving and move faster than the spread of the, of the hot weather heading south. So that the data would suggest that frost is, is on the increase quicker than the, the heat is, but it's still very important, especially in your area and no, north of the Great Eastern Highway. The other challenge and, and the real lever, and you can see why growers are driven to get these um, shorter season varieties in earlier, is that we are seeing uh, overall declines in growing season rainfall. So we're farming in an environment where frost risk is increasing, End of season warmth is increasing and winter may not, or it's not appearing as wet as it used to be. So that's a real driver for growers to get crops in early um, to protect that yield. So in our system, we've got to work out a way how we can do that without ramping up the frost risk. Because we all know that on average, we're going to be better off with early sowing crops um, on most of the landscape. The other thing, this is a chart uh, generated by Ben Bidoff showing um, thermal accumulation. So the black line is thermal accumulation. So effectively um, degree days or days or hours of uh, warmth by daylight. And the blue is the frequency of frost events. But the key thing to note here is effectively it's getting warmer and plants that, that don't use day length to do their maturity will actually accelerate their growth. So varieties like scepters and wild catchum We'll be, we'll be going through its um, thermal time faster in, in this sort of period than they were back um, almost 100 years ago. So we are seeing these varieties are actually running through much faster. Winters, the winter days aren't as cold, um, aren't as cloud covered as they used to be and crops are growing through their development phases much faster. This chart here, and I'd be keen to get some feedback from Danny um, or other people who want to want to comment, but it's really talking about the susceptibility. This is a schematic that um, Ben Bidoff and I kind of pulled together, um, but it's really trying to identify where the vulnerabilities are. So we've got oats here. Uh, oats are our safest cereal to grow. But they do get a bit more vegetative frost damage. They'll, they'll get you know, steam elongation time. You'll often see tillers knocked off um, or a bit of damage in the boot. But during the flowering window, oats are, are much more tolerant and during grain fill. So we, we see they handle the frost better. Um, wheat can get taken out by frost regularly and it's most vulnerable kind of either side of that flowering window. So flowering on either side is when we see wheat getting smashed 
mostly with frost. It does get um, frost damage during grain fill, and that's when you get the frost distorted grains. Um, I believe last year's frost event on the 3rd of September was more about uh, flower frost and less about grain damage, but there'll be variations on that in the wheat. But what we have seen here is barley. We've always been promoting barley as a safer frost tool, and it is, and it is on average. But there's this little window here where barley is in grain fill. And while barley is in grain fill, it doesn't have the extra layer of husk over it. So it's easier to get frost distorted damage in the barley. And it's not unlike putting your cheek against the, uh, against the car windscreen. Um, that single layer of husk as the barley grain fills um, is easier to be damaged and distorted. Yeah, the so we can touch on your experiences, but we might do that again a bit later. On. Or, or Doug, do you want to? Sorry, want sorry, Gary. Talking. Sorry, Garen. Dad just asked me a question. I'll, yeah, I'll just... No worries. We, we might come on to this. I've got this slide again later on, so we might have a couple more growers on then. So maybe we'll touch on it there. Here's some data uh, demonstrating that previous slide that I showed you. So um, what we have here is on the left axis, we've got grain yield. On the bottom is sterility. So this is flowers knocked out by frost. Uh, at Murest during 2016, so very cold site, multiple frost events. But if you look at the wheat, most of the wheat varieties are running at over 80% uh, complete uh, sterilisation of the flowers. You can see the barley varieties in a range, uh, quite affected, um, but still more significantly less than the wheat. And then we can see the oats is really all, every oat variety was under 20%. Um, or every oak treatment was under 20% frost. And when you look at the yield, you know, the, there's a clear grouping of the uh, oak varieties well over, well over four tonne, whereas the uh, wheat varieties are, are all hanging around that one tonne or less, or just about all of them. So, um, and that translates into real data on a paddock scale. This is some work uh, done by Ben Wisson at Coolum. So this is evaluating a range of varieties over a range of sowing times. So we've got a mid-April sowing, a uh, second half of May sowing, and then an early June sowing. And what you're seeing here, this is gross return. So basically price by yield um, <clears throat> of a range of wheats. So we've got the winter wheats like wedge tail, uh, forest, and we had cutlass as the long, uh, trojan as the mid, and then we had scepter and emu rock. Um, and then you can see the barley varieties and then you can see the oat varieties. And what we're seeing is in mid-April, the wheat's completely smashed. So varieties like Scepter, Trojan and Cutlass yielded zero. Um, that's really really frosted. This is on a frost-prone site. Uh, the winter wheats were, were generating a bit of income. But you can really see the, the oats being the standout in that sowing window. Once we swing to May, um, we start seeing the returns from the oats are dropping off, as you'd expect. Um, second half of May, um, oats are more likely to run into some drought stress and the yield's been held back a bit and the quality. And we start seeing um, the barley uh, shining. But still, um, barley and oats are significantly out, uh, out returning wheat. But, you know, the wheat's starting to get in, get, you know, the cutlass there. Um, it's getting too late for these varieties in that window, but we're starting to see cutlass shine, but still the trove and a bass was still smashing it. And on the frost prone side, even in June, uh, the barley is still out returning the wheats, but we are seeing that more of the wheats are on their way up as far as generating a return. So you know, on a frost prone site, there's a fair argument to say that wheat is never going to, or on average, wheat isn't your most possible, um, profitable crop and, and barley is more in the May. And if you get a chance to get it in and up in the April window, then oats is going to be a safe event. I have some photos here on the symptomology, but I might just click through them slowly, but really you can see healthy anthers. You know, this is the most vulnerable time for wheat to be frosted. Um, healthy anthers here, whereas within a few days of being frosted, they go to that yellow, uh, off-white. Um, yeah, so you can tell quite easy the damaged ones within a few days of the frost. Uh, some photos of stem frost damage, but I think a lot of you guys are familiar with that. 
And then we got the distorted grain. So this is grain that was bought off or 50% formed. Really, it was a bag of water, and that water's frozen. And you can see now this would be a frost probably 10 days previously where the <clears throat> grain has started to shrivel. And um, really, it just becomes very picky and not much in it at all. When the grain's more formed, so it's got a larger, more starts to get doughy, then we see shriveled and distorted grains, but um, that can contribute to yield. But ones like this grain will we'll just go at the back of the header. <clears throat> and I wanted to touch on that wheat versus barley. This is where I was showing you back in that previous slide. This is healthy barley grains during grain fill. And these are frost damaged grains during grain fill. And you can see this is the, the outside of the grain, so the bit facing the outside. And you can see where the frost is frozen and dented in the back of the grain. Um, so that's that impact of not having that extra layer of husk. And it's, we, we do find that barley during grain fill can get hit quite hard with frost in that, in that window. This is the impact where we see um, some flower frost on barley, where we get barley heads with missing grains knocked out. But you know, it's rare for barley to be frosted and damaged back to zero, whereas it's quite easy with, with a variety like uh, wild catch or scepter to uh, be 100% frosted, where barley, you know, even in a really bad frost year, it usually still yields a ton or a ton and a half when the wheat next door could be, could be tracking at zero. And the other one, my favourite is oats. Um, nothing's bulletproof, but at the moment, oats are the closest thing we have to being bulletproof as far as oats go, goes. But in your farming system, and you guys would know this very, very well, that you're really trading off frost for drought. So um, if, there's no point in putting oats in if you don't have enough stored soil moisture because you'll end up with lightweight quality problems, but you are gaining on the frost tolerance. And you can see here on this photograph, there's some, there's some flowers or spikelets that have been taken out here by an early frost. Uh, this wasn't during, this is basically if some damage occurred in the boot. Um, so it does get a bit of damage, but they always seem to go on and yield well um, in, a, in a frosty environment while they can still take damage. But as a farmer, you are definitely trading off in your area uh, that frost versus drought risk. Canola. My line with canola is don't be fooled. Um, Doug, my understanding is in your area this year, canola did quite well. Is that right? Yeah, it did. Um, it seemed to have a baseline, even in the frosted ground, where it didn't go below sort of... Um, Five or six hundred kilos too often. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, that was a difference between the, compared to the cereals. Yes. Yep. No, that's great. And it's really interesting canola. Um, we actually don't understand much about canola and frost, but what I have learned is canola is very tolerant to frost at flowering and early grain fill. Um, seems to be able to get frozen and, and recover, and uh, while it, it might knock some flowers off, it it can regrow those flowers early in the season and still top up and make up for you. When, when we get the bad frost in canola, and I think it's just purely for your area, the timing, that 3rd of September event, was the canola still quite yellow then, Doug? Yeah, some of them were. Some of the earlier varieties had done the business, but, yeah, there were some, still some flowers around, yeah. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I, I, I find when we get our most devastating frosts in canola is when you've got about 2% flowering left. So just that scattering of flowers over the top and you think, gee, I'll be swathing this in 10 days. Um, and the crop's got no ability to compensate. And it seems like the grains of, you know, you've got the grains have started to form and fill and they're actually getting some water. Uh, you know, the juicy just starting to milk up. And that's when, when we get a bad frost event on that timing, there's no ability for crop to compensate. The flowering's finished, the soil profile's drying and we can get some severe damage. So. My big warning is don't, don't think that just because canola did well last year that you can go planting all your frost grown country for canola. Um, it's an expensive crop to grow and, um, and it does get frosted. It just doesn't always get frosted at the same time as your cereals get frosted. So in 2016 in my area, uh, lots of the canola still performed very well. Um, 2017, we had a lot less frost and the canola was actually more damaged the following year than it was um, in 2016. It may be that there's some acclimation in canola and maybe 
Brenton or some of the other uh, researchers down the track will be able to measure that for us. But might be that being a brassica, if we get lots of winter frosts, that may help it tolerate it, frost later on. But certainly when we get damage, um, when we get a year that coincides with the wrong time in, in canola, it's very expensive and can be severely hit. So it'd be a real word of warning is be careful how much canola you put in the valley floor or on your frost prone country. Lupins, uh, lupins get frosted, but you, know, you can see the uh, damaged grain here. But you know, I had uh, last year clients who were opening lupin pods uh, full of ice. There was ice all through the pods. I was out there a week later and they thought it was going to be terrible. And we opened the pods up and we had to open about 50 pods before we found a missing grain. So just because the pods freeze doesn't mean they're going to be stuffed. Um, <clears throat> You just got to wait and see. What we often see is this effect. You can see this uh, pod hanging off and going to fall. Um, we get a bit of damage to the peduncle. So lupins, when we get, they do get a frost event on it, they're much more prone to shedding and uh, and dropping the pods that, than when we don't have a frost event. So it's a thing to be warned warned about in, in a uh, in a year we have a lot of frost events. Try and get your lupins off early if you can. So the true cost of frost. Um, Frost costs the industry every year. One, emotionally, um, it's interesting, during the frost talks last year, we had a, a grower came to the meeting and, and he said he hasn't been able to enjoy his good years. So he's getting a fantastic spring and his mates are ringing up, so oh, let's go for a crappie, bring some beers around. And he just hasn't felt like he could go and enjoy the good season until he captured it because... He's just too nervous now that September might take away everything that he's grown and all his years work. Um, so he doesn't actually relax and enjoy the year until it's actually there um, because in his patch, the frosts have been too too, um, too frequent. So there's a real emotional cost and it, and it does mess with the decision making. There's obviously the financial impact pact, and a lot of businesses could have used that extra income over the years, um, <clears throat> over the years to reinvest in the business. Uh, in lime and succession planning and expansion and those sort of things. And, and it's probably no surprise that um, prior to the last four or five years where the central wheat growth had a good run, that a lot of the advancements and technology driven in ag has been in the north and, and the southeast of the wheat belt. So in the Esperance and, and the Geraldton region, because those guys haven't battled the frost that we had through the uh, early part of the 2020s. Uh, the opportunity cost. Um, the strategies you put in place to try and manage frost come at a cost, or well, some of them do. You know, it'd be nice if you could just grow one wheat variety and start early and finish when you want and rush through. But in a frost prone area, you can't do that. Or you grow oats as, as your frost tool um, and then you get a dry finish. And gee, it would have been better if I could have, could have put wheat in there. So there's a real opportunity cost to managing frost. Um, delaying sowing, we know that later sowing crops have a lower potential. <clears throat> But it's about matching that to, to the yield uh, and the, the realistic yield potential. And, you know, often frost-prone paddocks, we're, we're stuck with less profitable rotations. Um, we're not game to push canola onto a frostier paddock or those sort of things. And the other one is a lost research. Um, when we get a year like last year in your area, uh, most of the NVT will be thrown out and not used. And there would have been a lot of... Um, Deep herd trials in the area that where the data is going to be a bit questionable, and and so we do lose out on, on that as well. So it's a pretty big cost for frost. In the year we have frost, get frosted, and in the years we don't because we're trying to make sure we don't. So it's important we don't let last year's frost um, impact your management decisions for this year and make and um, make you miss out on opportunities. So that's what we're going to focus on on our next part of our talk. I'd um, schedule a, a five-minute breather, everyone. Um, did you want to just keep rolling or where are you at? Keep rolling, Garen. Keep rolling, yep. I'm, I'm happy, but yeah. Great. And uh, am I going too fast, Doug? No, I'm pretty, I think you're covering over it. Everyone's coming in for the nutrition session, so this is the one right. we want to hear, so yeah. Yeah, cool. Yep, excellent. So what happened in 2021 and nutrition after a frost? What we're going to focus on now. So, what happened in 2021 in your area? You had um, <clears throat> below, below zero for well over 12 hours. 
and some sites were measuring um, minus three. I remember waking up, set my alarm and wake up at four o'clock that morning. I think it was Ben Cabin was down at minus four. Um, so there's some real extreme events. And that also coincided with that late afternoon drizzle that we talked about earlier and how that potentially brought in some ice nucleating bacteria, which meant that the plant actually froze at a lower temperature as well. So a pretty extreme event through that area. <clears throat> um, down my way, so more in the lakes area, um, it started off pretty cold, but but didn't get didn't get extreme enough, luckily. So there's some a map of the deeper generated map showing um, the coldest areas, but really this big strip here was was pretty severe, as you guys know. Um, the temperatures reached through the lakes area were cold enough um, to be damaging, but 3rd of September, really most of our crops were still in the boot. So our, our crop development is slower. Um, obviously in the frost belt guys are probably a bit better at spreading out their, their timings, but also mostly they were just lucky in that um, the crops were slower developing, still in the boot, and were able to tolerate that, that frost a little better. Um, here's another chart showing the cold events from the 7th to the 13th of September. So the week after, there were still a couple more frosts to add to it, but um, not as severe as that, uh, as that previous one. We also had quite a nasty one in late um, August as well. Garen, about, I think it was about maybe 10 to 14 days before the, the big, big frost that you kind of mentioned. Yes, okay, yep. So there's one that kind of slipped under the radar, was it, in August one? Yeah, definitely. I reckon that did a lot of damage that a lot of people probably didn't actually see till they actually went out and started having a look for after the really big frost, if that makes sense. Yeah, so they went out a few days after the big one and there's already damage there. Yeah, there's a yeah, that, that other the one before it had already done a bit as well. It wasn't as severe, but it had still already done a bit of damage on all those yeah, okay. yep. earlier crops. Yeah. Yep. And it does seem when we get those years where the pattern's right, um uh, we often blame one event, but most frost years, when it, when it's right for a frost, we'll get three or four of them in a 10-day window sort of thing. That's pretty common, unfortunately. <clears throat> so after frost, there's a fair bit of hype. Uh, I'm hitting the papers, everyone's talking. Uh, everyone's a bit panicked and going, shit, how bad am I? What's the damage? Um, there's a fair bit of misdiagnosis. I've heard reports of um, farmers being told that every, the whole, every paddock on their farm is 100%. Um, you know, it is pretty pretty tough as a young agro or just trying to get a handle on it and, and what you pick. Um, <clears throat> because one of those things, it's not like you can train for it out of the year. There's only a little window where you can um, get your eye in. So um, a lot of panic, a lot of misdiagnosis, misinformation. And for a while there, um, it looked like things were going to be a complete disaster um, in your area. Um, plenty of pub talk. Um, and it doesn't really help the situation. So. Really the main thing when we have a frost event, it's important to assess your own situation, not get caught up in the hype and make some good decisions for your business going forward. I thought um, we could touch on some of your observations um, about your situation. Did you want to kick off, James? Um, were you seeing wheat hit worse than barley or was the barley already, some years we've already put the barley on the high risk paddocks anyway and it gets more than its share? What, what were your observations? Yeah, I don't know. I personally thought that the wheat um, got hit a lot harder than the barley. Um, there was kind of, a, it was quite, because it was quite a wet seeding, there was quite a big range in um, sowing windows this year as well. Yes, yep. Quite interesting. Um, you know, people sowing, um, like a lot of people wanted to keep sowing after their canola and you know they're pulling putting in chief probably earlier than what they've ever done before and things like that everyone just yeah. got a bit of um yeah a bit of a blood rush i'm um, trying to put everything in at once which didn't yeah. help the situation either but yeah i definitely think that wheat got hit harder so i reckon similar to what doug said the canola was probably bottoming out at i don't know maybe about five six hundred kilos it wasn't going too much below that i didn't think yeah so it's paying its way even in the bad patches yep yeah definitely that, that's my kind of thoughts yes and what about the barley how did that stand up yeah there's there's i don't reckon there's probably as much through a lot of the um meriden area compared to maybe three years ago but i thought it was generally holding up i know some of the guys out at southern cross started on their barley and some of that was going about you know two and a half three and they were absolutely thrilled where their wheat was probably going more i know 800 to 
Yeah, yeah. What they probably what averaged. In the cross event, if the cross is at the wrong time, your wheat can be dropped to zero. Whereas barley almost never goes under a ton. Um, has to be really bad to to really belt it. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Garen, if I can interrupt, I I'd agree with a lot of what James has said. With barley, probably the biggest um, impact was the quality. So with a lot of grain being at um, grain fill when that frost happened because it had been sown so early, yeah, it was very lightweight. Yeah, so sometimes I call that popcorn barley. It's all um, frost yeah. distorted, sucked in, lots of volume and not much weight to it. Yeah, that, um, you know, Meriden had a feed egg stack very quickly come harvest time. Yes, yeah. And how did that wash out in the end? Is, did that, is that been sold? Has it been a tradable grain or it's just delivered and waiting? Um, I probably haven't gone back to follow up, but my assumption would be that it would have been sold or um, gotten dealt with in some manner. Yeah, Shandy, back um, to the other feed grants, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, generally I know from my client base um, in the areas that were hard hit both in wheat and barley, um, you know, guys were doing samples in paddocks and then working out a game plan. So a lot of discussion on how to ensure that grain got in the bin and, you know, at a at a hopefully and not a feed X grade. Yeah. I reckon about prior to 2008, 2009, barley was really good at frost because um, we were growing varieties like Bodan and Gardner and a bit after that, Scope. And those varieties yeah. crawl around on the ground and they dribble tillers out over a window. So every plant would have a grain at a head of grain fill, a head just emerged and everything in between. These new high yielding, I call them high marsh types, so high marsh derivatives, so um, <clears throat> high marsh and scope and uh, high marsh, Spartacus and Maximus, they're really good yielders. They're quick, but every head pokes out at the same time. So the diversity within each head, when we get that grain fill damage, every head's almost at the same stage, whereas a variety like scope or gardener, just dribbles out heads, looks ugly, but the heads are at all different stages. Whereas this, this line of barley that's performing very well um, by the synchronicity of head emergence does mean when we get a, a frost at the wrong time, it's hitting most heads or a lot of the grain in each head. So it does make it more severe. But yeah, definitely want to reiterate that. Don't get over, don't get too cocky about canola handling frost last year because it won't every year. So some, I spoke to a few growers and um, and a couple of agros in the area and some general sort of generalized sort of statements. And it's always you always get you're always wrong when you have a generalization statement. But the sort of thinking was that April barley or barley pre first of May was kind of of the barley was the worst hit of the barley. Um, first to tenth of May was kind of 50, 60 percent done coming in around the ton mark. And then almost barley after the 15th of May was did very well and almost unscathed. Um, other things was comments were made that wheat after the 10th of May was pretty soft, pretty pretty unaffected, and earlier so on wheat was uh, was was the worst hit. Um, Steve Curtin and I went out, uh, caught up with Callum Wesley and a group of growers out there um, in October last year, and there's one grower in the group who actually had a breakdown, tracked the broke down during seeding, blew out 10 days of, of his seeding window and he's almost unscathed. So the yeah, unfortunate, lucky for him, but you know, sometimes it doesn't take a big shift to make a, make a big difference. And generally the canola, like your comments, Doug, was mostly okay from what I picked up from talking to people and was a big, big kicker in uh, saving the budget, which is great. So frost is emotionally challenging. Uh, and mentally challenging. Now you can see there, a, uh, this photo is taken out just east of Narragin where growers uh, had a bit of fun with his header. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but it's just important to know when we do get a shit year and a shit result um, that the, this might help you understand your feelings or help understand what's going on with some of your mates and people in your community. But you know, the impact of a frost is not unlike a, a death. It's a sudden impact, um, and and it does it 
does affect all of us um, and, and not just the growers, but, you know, I, I imagine some of the young advisors in Meriden during that event were probably having a few sleepless nights um, trying to make sure they were giving the best advice they can. But, you know, the key thing, <clears throat> yeah, is to be aware that it, that it does, does affect you and, and it's going to affect you and your friends a bit differently. So at the end of the day, from what I've gleaned, uh, and also had a chat to Nick McGregor as well, the 3rd of September turned out turned a super profit year, which is going to be a, a best ever year for the district and, and a real opportunity to, to build, a, build a war chest and, and um, drought proof your business um, into a profit year. So from what I've heard, luckily, um, it wasn't a wipeout um, and the high price and the canola for a lot of growers um, made, turned it into a reasonable year. But gee, it, added a lot of stress and um, hard work to the year that, that wasn't needed. Does that kind of sum it up, James? Yeah, I think the protein split really saved a lot of people, like some of the other Southern Cross up guys that were getting, you know, more like five to 700 kilos of wheat because they're they getting pretty much, you know, 15% protein or whatever. So they were getting that much higher price. That meant they were probably still doing thereabouts a ton of, you know, what they yeah, were doing. Yeah, gotcha. so I was adding another $80 a yeah. ton. Yeah, exactly. Yep. yep. So that, that definitely helped. But yeah, there was kind of a mixture of break evens to prop a little bit of profit. Yeah. Yeah. So I chatted to two or three different consultancy groups and and nobody said they had a client on their books that was like a wiped out, like a massive business loss, um, as in negative return. Um, but they said everybody lost multi million dollars of, of potential profit. Um, here's some, some figures from the Consolidate benchmarks. Uh, the green line um, is the low rainfall zones. But what we can really see is, um, while we never want to have a year like last year, um, most of the businesses in the, in the last period have been able to generate some pretty good returns, uh, often above that 5%. And you, know, you get a year like, like 2018 um, with some, some great returns. Um, so we're able to better withstand a shock and a challenge of last year. Um, this is another chart. This is showing um, operating surplus versus operating costs. So the blue bars are operating surpluses with a trend line in black. So you can see most businesses have been generating improved surpluses over time um, compared to the horrible days back here where it had a run of tough years and, and a lot of the state was really in trouble um, following that 2008, 9, 10, and really 13 was a real, real saviour. Um, but the underlying trend and concern, I suppose, is this operating costs. While, we're, while we are generating more surpluses, a lot of that surplus is getting consumed or bought with more costs. Um, and with, coming, with years like the coming year, um, where costs are gonna spike again, that's gonna be really um, need some careful management. Um, if you drill down into those costs a little more, um, interestingly, the fertilizer and chem are following a similar trend. And if we, if I put in the machinery maintenance and repairs, um, that's also the same. Um, and even with machinery, when we pulled out, um, repairs and maintenance are not linked to the age of the equipment. But we're really seeing that over time we are spending more money um, growing our crops every year, which just adds to our risk profile. Uh, especially if we have an, a, a, a production shock like a frost. And you guys will be pretty, pretty over, you know, pretty good at managing droughts. You can see them coming and you stop your spending. And one of the challenges with the year like last year is you really, um, the season tracking world, the potential's there. So you're just going to keep feeding it. Uh, crop nutrition after a frost. So <clears throat> if you guys have grown a big crop, you've, um, put additional fertilizer on, uh, especially nitrogen from what I've heard, um, to match the season potential you're getting. And then the frost has brought that big crop back. And you guys wanna know what the implications are for the coming year. But the sad thing is that the nutrition requirements <clears throat> will change very little in 2022, whether you are frosted or not. And I'll go through that in, in more detail. Um, but it doesn't mean there isn't money to be saved and efficiency to be gained with the coming crop. But the reality is once that crop's growing, a lot of the, the nutrients is, um, is tied up and used and 
your big levers for nutrition don't change a lot um, pre and post frost or with or without frost. So here's some data. Um, there's lots of different data sets around on stubble, but this is um, some C4P1 um, showing the N or showing the nutrients tied up or removed in a three ton wheat crop. So you can see um, the nitrogen taken up by the plant versus the nitrogen uh, taken up by the grain, uh, the P and the K and the sulfur. <clears throat> and the big difference here, you can see that's the one nutrient and I'll go into that in more detail where when you get frosted, um, there's a lot more of that potash left in the system. So here's some stubble data. Um, James Easton did at Myling, but I think it's still relevant everywhere where they've looked at the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So total nitrogen in stubble uh, and carbon to see they've got unfrosted the first two and frosted. And there's small differences, but pretty much there was no difference in the carbon to nitrogen ratio of frosted stubble versus unfrosted stubble. And if you were to draw any conclusions, if anything, in this case, the frosted stubble actually had less N in it than the unfrosted stubble. So, but realistically, it's, there's no difference. So there's not a lot of N sitting in those stubbles ready to contribute back to, um, to next year's crop or to, this, to the coming crop. So for the coming season, banded N will be, if you're trying to work out how to grow a crop <clears throat> as cheaply as we can, banded N will be the most efficient N of the year. Doug, how do you get your end on at the moment? Um, yeah, no, we band it. We usually band about 50 kilos of urea. So yeah. at seeding, yep. Yeah, at dual shoot, yep. And that's pretty common. Is urea the product of choice mostly? Um, a few guys are doing liquids now, but um, most guys put a bit of um, end down the tube, yeah. So. Yeah, yep. Yep. So this yeah, is the know. hard end, um, more, you know, at $500 a tonne for urea, I've often said well, it doesn't matter how you get on, it's more efficient banded. Um, but, but in a year like this with a really high end price, it, it's going to start to really tease out and matter where, where you put that in and how you get the most out of it, uh, especially if you're trying to play a conservative hand with how much nitrogen your business can, is prepared to buy. One of the issues is that you guys are going to be contending with bigger stubbles than you normally do. Would that be right? You're on a pretty big crop. Um, if those stubbles are left on the surface and when it rains, they get, the bugs are trying, the microbes in the soil are going to try and rot that stubble down. And to do that, they're going to need a nitrogen source. So they're going to try and suck in from the soil or if you've just sprayed it on in the form of UAN, that, that'll land on the stubble and they'll try and use that if the stubble's wet to break down that stubble. So a big heavy stubble, it was a, it was a three tonne, uh, potential wheat crop or even a three and a half ton potential wheat crop you potentially got seven ton of stubble sitting um, on the ground so a big bulk that's going to need a lot of end to break that down so that's why this banding more than ever is going to be important to get underneath if, you, if you've kept the top stubble on the surface um, and it'll be worse with laid over stubble versus standing stubble because it's, the standing stubble isn't in contact with the ground so it won't be rotting anywhere near as fast and then you've got the option of pl playing the season with the top up end. The key thing to remember though, is the optimum economic rate for N is wider than you think. And with expensive nitrogen, last year's most economic rate won't be this year's most economic rate. And I've got some data from Professor David Panel. We had um, presented some PD and I thought I'd share that with you. I think it's really relevant for the coming year. And, and I think most of the wheat belt um, is just coming to terms with it or hasn't started to yet. But I think a lot of growers still think they're gonna put the same amount of N on as they normally do, because that's what they need to do. And the economics just don't stack up. So I've got this chart here. <clears throat> I'll show you on the side is dollars, on the bottom is kilograms of nitrogen. So this is kilos of N, so 80 units. Think of it as of, as of 160 kilos of urea. Um, obviously this is a variable cost, so that's just the cost of nitrogen. As the nitrogen goes up, it's a very flat line. Um, the cost of N increases. And this is the revenue. So yield by price. And we know as you put up, push up the N, it's a flatter point where you know, the yield's slowly creeping up, 
but it's kind of starting to flatline in this area. Um, and this is obviously the area where we're quite most responsive uh, to nitrogen. If you deduct the variable cost from the revenue, we get the true uh, response curve, which is really showing that and in that flat part of the curve up here, the cost, you know, a big dose of nitrogen uh, isn't economic and is not returning um, a profit. So you can see in this case, you know, the peak profitable point here is around 40 units of nitrogen, where you're maximizing your revenue um, minus cost. So what we've done here, at the same site, uh, $1.09, that's around $500 per tonne for urea. $2, that's around uh, $1,000 a tonne for urea. And $3.20, that's around the $1,500 a tonne for urea. So if we're operating last year at around the $500 mark, at this site, with this data, the optimum rate was around 80 units of N. But if, for the coming year, if we're going to be buying um, $1,500 or $1,000 uh, nitrogen, the most profitable spot is significantly lower. Um, for example, at the $1,500 mark, which we're getting close to hitting again since the war started, um, we're looking at 35 units of N in an environment where 80 units last year was the optimum uh, rate. So the rule of thumb pulled out of this, and it will vary, but we do need to be aware that it'll be less. In this case, tripling of the nitrogen price is halving the optimum rate. So I question, Garen. Sorry? Sorry, question, mate. What yeah. values do you put on your grain there? Um, it was current pricing as of December. Okay, so about the same. Probably about the same, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and we've got the matrices on the protein difference and things, but really the payment for protein. Uh, I didn't want to complicate the message, but really it was that you're not going to put nitrogen on to buy protein, you don't get paid enough for it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but I think the key message here is if you're used to putting 60 units or in your area it might be 35 or 40 units of N on to grow your crop, um, the economics have significantly changed. If you're, that's if you've still, depending, of course it varies depending on when you bought your fertiliser, but the optimum rate won't be what it was last year. Um, yeah, you might find the profitable point is at a, lower, at a lower yield. I think that's really important. Now the other one, Dave Panel's done the analysis and said, if you're happy to operate within 5% of the optimum, so we never know what the right, exactly the right rate of nitrogen was until after the year. So every year it's a bit of a guessing game on how hard you push in. But if you're comfortable to operate within 5% of the best rate of N, what's the range that you could operate in? Does that make sense? So, this one is the $500 a ton nitrogen. And this one is the $1,500 a ton for urea. And at $1,500 a ton, the optimum point is coming in around 40 units of N. But if you're happy to operate within 5% of the optimum rate, so you'll get similar result if you're 65 units of N, or just under 20 units of N, you're within 15, sorry, within 5% of the optimum profit. So often as an agro and as farmers, we get really hung up on trying to get the exact rate of N. And what we realize is with this flat response curve, there's actually quite a wide window of where you're close to optimum profit. Of course, there's always the FEMO, fear of missing out. Um, what if I get a better year and if you think you're here and the season lifts? Or what if the grain price goes up? Uh, obviously, if you push up this way, you're going to capture more of that upside if, if things change, um, like your yield potential increases or uh, the grain price goes up. But playing a conservative hand in a normal year, if it ends up with an average start and an average winter, um, you might find that your banded end is a good start and you don't need a lot to top it up. So got here with a flat payoff function, you've actually got a little bit of wiggle room to not be way off the pace for profit. How does that make you feel, Doug? Yeah, that's pretty good, Garen. Um, 
I can get away with zero then, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, what about canola? Is there the same response curve with canola or is um, as, as cereals? The I expect so. Um, the this work was actually generated. Dave Panel's been doing work in the US uh, on corn because in the Gulf of Mexico, um, basically in the river delta there, uh, they, they grow a lot of corn and the growers are pushing in higher and higher and higher and they're having uh, impacts with the quality, water quality in the Gulf of Mexico. And he's doing this work with the farmers there to let them know that actually that can be more profitable at a lower point of end. So the same result is working in corn, so I can't see why it wouldn't be in canola. Um, obviously, with a very high price canola, the, curve, the shape of the curve is different, but I think the, but the proper point um, is wider than we think still. Tricky question, Garen. Yeah. Um, what about headlands and stuff like that? Um, a soil test will have to prove that out for you, but... Um... Well, you know, I think a year like this was really expensive fur. The headlands have had a long run of double fur, talking compounds. Um, it would be quite easy to um, turn them off on the first, on one of the passes, on the first pass, the fertilizer, or halve the rate. Put it down. Yeah, that's what I was off. thinking. Yep. Yeah. Um, it's amazing how many of my clients the last couple of years um, have found they had to go back and get another 10 and 20 ton because of their, because the first year they, change the GPS system and the workman left a few little gaps. So now he's shit scared of doing it. So he's been careful not to turn off at the ends too early. And suddenly we're having to go and buy another 10 and 20 tonne of fur at the end of the season. Um, if we're having to do that every year, it's going to get pretty expensive. And I think there's a real window where we could be really cutting back on those and not giving up much on our potential haul. Okay, those, those are the over fertilised parts of the paddock. So on the end front, um, the price of ends changed. So the most economic result, uh, rate will change unless we see a tripling of grain price. Um, but yeah, the, the rate that was most been most profitable when we we're operating at $500 a tonne nitrogen won't be the case um, at, uh, at current grain price and current um, end price. It'll be a lower rate, will be the most economic. It'll vary from paddock to paddock and soil to soil, but the general thing is, if you're normally running at 40 units of end, well, that won't be the most economic rate for the coming year, unless we see massive spikes in the grain price. Summer rain is your friend. Um, is that right that you guys have had a fair lick of rain in patches, especially through the frost belt? Would that be right? Oh, it's been pretty patchy, Garen. It's been a bit of a thunderstorm. Like you'll get some guys that have had 80 and then not too far away, maybe 15 to 20. And then there's been other patches about 25 to 50. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, cool. But overall, it's a real positive. Um, one, it'll, it'll wash the mobile nutrients out of the stubble. So you had a wheat crop that was going to go three ton. It got frosted. You pulled off 1.2. Um, most of the end is gone. Um, don't quite know where it goes, but it's not there anymore. Um, there's definitely more sugars in that, and that's why the frost and stubbles go black. And the, that's because the funguses and molds and things start working on those sugars straight away. But the potash is also mobile. So these rains that have happened through your strip will be washing the potash out of the stubble and the sugars and uh, any other, if there's any nitrogen left in it, that'll be washed out of the stubble as well. So if you decide to remove the stubble later on, once you've had a rain on it, your, your impact on the nutrition isn't as great as if you'd say had a burn straight after harvest without a rain on it. So, and the, and the flip side also is uh, the mineralization of in um, having some wet subsoils now would be, uh, mineralizing in and, and building up your, or mineralizing organic matter and building up your end status. So that's a real positive if you've been lucky enough to be under the shower. So what about the phosphate? <clears throat> if you grow a three ton wheat crop, um, or on wheat, three kilos of P is removed per ton of grain. 
and roughly half a kilo of pea per tonne of grain is tied up in this double. So a three tonne wheat crop takes up around 10 and a half kilos of pea to grow. Roughly nine of that is in the grain. If you put eight kilos of pea on, uh, I guess that for your area, but imagine that's kind of a standard sort of rate. If you put eight kilos of pea on, roughly probably been a bit generous. Uh, pea uptake isn't that great, but I've said 25% uptake of the pea you applied means of the 10 and a half was taken up by the crop, two came from the fertilizer applied that year and the remaining eight and a half came from your history or from your phosphate bank. So of the eight of P, two was taken up by the crop, the other six had joined the bank, which is in the long-term pool of less available P. And if you were frosted, and even if you took no grain off, what you've saved is just nine kilos of P. But in reality, the phosphate bank is massive. So whether you took that nine off or not, the implications for next year, all the fresh pea that was applied last year has now been um, reacted with the soil, fixed to iron oxides and, and locked up in the big bank. Um, so whether you took that nine of pea off or not um, really has no impact on next year's phosphate decision. Does that make sense? So the reality is phosphate, your phosphate rate for next year, the key drivers for that will be your price. When did you buy your phosphate? What price was it? Um, got a couple of lucky clients who did some end of June purchases who are feeling pretty, pretty pleased with themselves, but um, <clears throat> and I've got some clients who haven't locked any phosphate in at all. So depending on what you paid, paid for your fertilizer, that's gonna be, um, have a big impact on what rate you can afford or what your economic rate is versus someone else who has a different price. Obviously the financial status of your business and your attitude to risk. Some of my clients have said, well, I made more than budget last year. I'm happy to um, spend a bit more on fertilizer. I feel like I need to put on what I always do and they don't want to change their rates. Um, when I chat with our financial consultants, they laughed at me and said, well, that's a pretty stupid approach. Why would you use last year's profits to pay for next year's losses? So um, just different ways of thinking about things. But um, at the end of the day, um, your attitude to risk and your financial status will have an impact on what, how much phosphate you're prepared to put, put in the ground. And the big one really, and this is really the big kicker, is what your phosphate history has been. If you've been able to, to build a decent phosphate bank, if you've got pretty good levels, um, with expensive pea, it could be an opportunity to, to drop back a unit or two and have uh, minimal to no impact on your uh, yield potential. Uh, whereas if you've got newer land, more high reactive irons, high fixing, um, it could be quite expensive if you drop your pea back. Um, so of course your phosphate history, your supply of pea is important, and of course your yield potential. So if we end up with a similar start to last year, you wouldn't want to be putting a crop in on three or four P for the coming year because it could be really expensive. But if we have a, uh, a shitty start, um, yeah, there may be a better opportunity to trim a little bit. Um, pH is Doug. How are the pHs in your area? Obviously there's, there's wadgel areas. Um, have guys been liming or how's the tracking? Yeah, most of us are liming. Got a third pass of lime going on now, Karen, in yeah. most situations. All yeah. our high producing country is pretty well lined and sort of, you know, above 5.2 to 5.4. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so we've spent the money. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, if you've got healthy soil, I mean, you know, phosphate is a nutrient that the roots have to grow to. So you need those fine root hairs to take the phosphate up if you're trying to exploit your phosphate bank. And when you've got a pH in the range of fives, um, you know, that's really good for fine root growth and really helps the uptake. You know, allows your crop to export that pea history. So um, on the flip side, if you've got a pretty acid soil and it's gravelly with high, high uh, PBI, um, it's going to be very hard for the crop and you're going to need a, a decent lick going on um, to achieve the potential. So pea going from $3.30 to uh, you know, virtually doubling nearly six bucks. I don't feel this year is the year to top up the pea bank. Um, I think we're trying to look at a... Uh, a replacement model or a maintenance model um, for the coming year. Um, 
especially where you've got you know, lower good P levels, you know, around that 30 or better, um, low PBIs, so meaning the phosphate bank's readily available, you know, kind of 40 or under. Um, <clears throat> and realistically, if you've got a good P level and a low P PBI, you're probably not going to get a big yield response um, about going above that five to seven of seven of P. And the exceptions are really where, where the paddocks that need that line and a higher fixing. So I was chatting to Foz the other day and he was saying that in your area, um, some of the alkaline moral soils can be quite high fixing um, and ones to avoid on cutting back. Any comments or objections to that? What are you thinking, Danny? I guess the only comment I'd make about the moral soils is, you know, if you ex expected yields year in, year out, you know, 1.2 to 1.4 top top end, um, you just got to be careful you don't shoot for two tonne, even though it's got a high phosphorus yeah. retention. So. so it's really running back to this bit, um, your yield potential, if it's a low yield potential anyway, yeah. Um, there's no point in it's not like that, that soil in a wet environment um, would might be a different scenario, but if it's not going to, if it hasn't already got a profile of moisture by seeding, you might still pay conservative hand. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Can you hear me, Garen? Yes, I can, James. Yeah. Oh, Andrew, how are you going? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Joining a fraction late. Just okay. um, on those uh, phosphorus applications. Yes. Um, yeah, how how nervous would you be about uh, maybe a, a recent history of declining phosphorus levels? Um, there's been some increased production in the area. Um, you know, maybe substituting some uh, P in the past for uh, for lime. Yes, um, it's certainly got to be noted. Yeah, I, I've observed that with a few of my clients and a couple of clients in the Lake King area. We've kind of got our system working well, and we've had. Um, a run of pretty good years and we've, we've been pulling you know in that area three three and a half ton crops off and we've, we're kind of fertilizing for two two and a half and that removal equation we've just been sneaking a bit off every time um you know we haven't quite put the put it back thinking around the corner we'll have a shit year and that'll be the bank that'll be the year we cut the bank up um but it hasn't happened in the last four or five years i think i don't think one year is going to do it so yep. I don't think you're going to fall off a cliff. Those where you're able to drop your P bank, that's a soil type where the phosphate is available, and one crop won't mean you fall off a cliff. Um, with it so expensive, I still think it's an expensive year to put that back. Um, but I think we need to be aware of that. Where we've had a run of good years, that when we get an opportunity to buy at a more decile five or yeah, you know, more. Um, realistic phosphate price, I think it makes a lot of sense to try and top that up. Yep. But just right now, and obviously no one can guess what next year's price is or the year after, but right now having seen a doubling in price and last time it doubled in that 2008-9 period, it was only a short window. Um, yeah, it doesn't feel like the year to go putting a lot on. <clears throat> um, it might be a yeah, better opportunity to play a conservative hand or a normal, normal rate this year and and address that down the track. But but be mindful that it's happening. And if we pull another good year off, then we're going to have to start doing that. Yep. Um, the other one is, um, you know, what what products people are using. You know, if people, like the good thing is, as, as we touched on before, the area mostly went from having a super, super profit year to a profit year. So it's really good we're not in damage control, but, but we're, the budgets aren't as big as we were hoping and, and the coming year looks a bit scary. So I think there's real opportunity to trim back a bit, but, but it's not like we're hemorrhaging at the moment. So, yeah. Oh, where I was heading to um, was if you do decide or if growers decide to trim their phosphate rate back a bit, it might be an opportunity to look for a different product. So, you know, a MAP type based product, um, if you're down below 30 kilos a hectare, you're really not getting a very good granule distribution of that phosphate. And, and it, just purely the number of granules for the number of plants, um, it's going to, some plants will struggle to find any of that phosphate. So moving to a, um, a lower analysis product that at a higher rate could be handy, especially if you're 
trying to grow, you know, having to drop back to that 30 kilo mark. There's not a lot of granules per hectare. So may need to look for a, a lower concentrated product. Now, and maybe Andrew down the track, we, we look for the cheapest source of pea to put in to top it up. You might be able to go with a blend with a bit of double super or something like that, just to, just to find a cheap way to get that pea up um, in a future year. Yeah, that uh, spatial distribution, uh, you still comfortable at, at foot spacings at 30, Gary? I think at a foot spacing, that's I think when you drop below 30, it starts to get down, but at a foot spacing, that's going to give you more granules and that'll be fine. But if you're someone was thinking of going at 25 um, kilos or something, once you drop below 30, I think that becomes an issue. But at 30 on a foot spacing, I'm com comfortable with that. Yep. Yep. And obviously, it matters more on the higher fixing soils than the lower fixing soils. So potassium, um, if you've had a frosted crop, most of the K remains in the crop residue. And as I, as I touched on before about summer rain being your friend, it doesn't take a lot of rain. Um, I've heard 10 mil and 20 mil mentioned previously, but it doesn't take a lot of rain to wash that potassium out of a straw. Um, for example, I was chatting to a grower yesterday at a uh, top crop meeting, and he observed that a couple of years ago he had swabbed canola and it had a rain, only a small rain event, like a 15 mil rain event on the canola swabs. And then he harvested and spread those swabs out. And he had massive potash waves where the rain had washed the potash out of the canola residue and had strips of high K versus low K um, because the rain washed potash from the, from the canola. So it doesn't take a lot because he actually harvested and spread the straw back out again. And it was just that rain event for the couple of weeks while the canola was in the windrow that um, washed it out. So on potassium, um, you're looking at 10 kilos per tonne of stubble and around four kilos per tonne removed in the grain. And as I said, the K is soluble and readily washes from the residue. And if you decide to burn, if you need to burn the stubbles, and I will we'll focus a bit more on stubbles later on, but if you decide to burn the stubble, um, the K does remain. It, it Very little is lost in the burn, but of course it remains in the ash fraction and then it really comes down to where does that ash um, end up. So if you had some rain events on the stubble, a lot of that potash would have washed out um, and there'll be less K, but if you haven't had much rain on it, um, the potash won't be lost uh, and vaporized, but it'll be turned into ash and then it's really a matter of where that ash ends up. So if you were to burn, you'd be trying to do it as close as you could to seeding if you hadn't had a good rain to wash out the potassium. I beat myself. Now, strategies going forward. Um, do one of the growers want to comment? Is there a lot of potash required in your area at the moment? Or most soils got pretty good reserves? Yeah, I'm, I'm still finding that I, um, I require potash. Yes. Yep. Karen? And, on, um, on the sand plains? Definitely on the sand plains. And um, just the nutrition after uh, canola crops, you know, canola just seems to uh, be so good at finding things. Yes. Um, so now we, uh, every time we think that we've, we've done a blanket of potash and uh, yeah, we, we just keep finding potholes again. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and that's a bit about your, uh, the bank running down the P bank. Uh, effectively, we're doing a similar thing on those lighter soils with the K bank, really, if we've, if we've been pulling off some bigger crops and growing bigger stubbles, we suddenly start moving more potash around in the system. Yep. Yep. And you know, and even things like as we go to you know, um, more tramline farming, you know, um, if the headers aren't spreading all the way, then we're going to start accumulating potash in you know, a centre of the header and, and out wide where it doesn't quite spread is going to get lower and lower. So if we need this year, like I often talk about potash and, and Banding K is always useful, but I often say, well, if you're trying to manage your bank, it doesn't really matter if you chuck out a bigger lick in the form of myriad, you know, 50 or 60 pre-seeding, and that'll do you for a couple of years. Or you can, if you're do, doing that on a regular basis, or you can band it and get away with a small amount. But obviously, um, you're not topping the bank up if you're putting your 10 or 12 down. You know, it's just really enough to trick the crop into thinking it's got enough potash um, to achieve yield potential. But you're actually slowly mining your subsoil um, when, if you're getting low. But I think this year at expensive K prices, it's really important to note that 
Potash banded as twice as effective a top dress than if we're just trying to get through next year um, and play a conservative hand. Uh, effectively, 12 units of cane in, in the furrow is pretty much similar to 50 kilos of muriate top dressed. So it's twice as efficient banded. So um, it's well worth being aware of that and taking some time. It might be might be doing your own blends or whatever, but um, a cheaper way to get, get through this year. Just a practical note, Garen. Um, we put mop in with the urea um, and we it's bad, but when it gets a dewy night, just give up on it, turn it off. Yes, yep, yep. Any showery rain. And uh, a bit of dew around or just damp air and you've got urea that wants to suck in moisture and potash. Um, so generally the blends will work better with a, an MAP-based fertiliser compound, um, but obviously not as easy in the system. <clears throat> Yeah, any chance you can to get the K in the furrow this year would be would be useful. But yeah, definitely um, it is hydroscopic and, and will suck in more moisture than, than without it. Um, like I touched on before, when the phosph when the when the price of murate doubles, the economic rate is not the same. So yeah, we, we often have a rule of thumb, you know, if you're below 50, uh, obviously it's linked to yield potential. If I'm in the western areas, it's below 60 or 70, depending on the yield potential. But really in your area, I'm not sure what you normally use, but you know, it's probably more like sites running below 40 parts per million. Um, it's probably going to be the critical level, whereas at $500 or 550 a tonne, it's probably around 50 parts per million. So just to be aware that, um, one, get in the furrow if you can, but two, the critical level has changed when the price has doubled. And from what I've done a bit of reading on the potash, and a lot of potash comes out of Russia and Belarus, so, you know, I talked about maybe the phosphate's a short-term price thing um, with what's going on in the world at the moment. Potash may be expensive for a few years to come and it's also controlled by uh, a few duopolies or monogopolies or whatever you call them. But my gut feeling is, is that potash may not recover as quickly as we'd hope. Um, so we may, over time, have to find ways to keep topping that bank up or, or yeah, profitable ways to do it. And I made this comment about how well did you spread the canola residue? Um, <clears throat> canola, I haven't got the data here, but takes up about twice as much potash in the canola stubble as a cereal, but very little is exported in grain. But it does matter what you did with the stubble. So you know, the old strategy of windrowing your canola and burning the windrow, um, great for weed control, but bloody expensive for potash. Now our levels are lower. So if you did a poor job of spreading and you've got four metres behind the header because it was harvested at night <clears throat> with a thick layer of canola residue, there's going to be plenty of potash there and the bits in between could be quite hungry. Mm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, and we're going to see a, you know, a further kick in canola areas this year if we get a half decent rain. I thought I'd touch on stubble. Um, I say it's semi tongue in cheek, but I and but sometimes I think stubble's overrated. Um, I know you might shoot me, but um, but I put I put up a list of negatives and positives. Um, and you guys are in an environment where we need to protect the topsoil, and water conservation is very valuable. I'm, I'm very aware of that. But um, this year we're going to have a lot of nitrogen tie up with a big bulk of stubble. Trash flow. Don't know if anyone's been past their barley stubbles lately, but be, be curious to note what we often see, especially if you have a summer rain, is the frosted barley, the first thing that happens is the roots rot off. So you go into the barley paddocks with the air seeder and all, there's nothing anchoring the barley stubble to the ground. And as soon as it hits, air seeder hits it, it all just falls over and comes free. Um, yeah, so it happens in all the crops, but especially in barley. So frosted stubbles don't behave the same as unfrosted stubbles if you're trying to get your, through your air seeder. Um, and also there's always that temptation in a badly frosted crop, no matter how much you tell yourself, to bring the, the comb of the header up a little bit higher and run the header a little bit faster when you're getting stuff all off it. So it's quite likely in the district that there's more stubble cut taller than normal um, and beware that trash flow is never as good on a frosted stubble as it is on an unfrosted stubble. These big stubbles are also going to create challenges for weed control. Um, 
big cereal crops. Uh, you had enough moisture for the for late germinations of grasses. <clears throat> you probably set a bit more, the crops set more yield potential and so of your weeds. And if you're trying to look at a, a um, you know, trying to get trifluorin to work into potentially five, six stubble, um, ton of stubble on the soil surface, uh, it could be pretty hard for the coming year. And the other one, and I'll go into this in more detail, but heavy stubbles, um, they protect the soil. They also stop the soil warming up and they increase the frost risk. Um, we regularly see more frost on higher stubble load paddocks than we do on bare ground. Um, we, see, we can measure that in both in yield and in uh, air temperature at head height. So seeding, in, seeding wheat into a big heavy stubble on a semi-frost risk paddock could amplify your frost risk on those paddocks. The other one, um, I know you guys aren't close to a um, export hay plant, but um, if you have frosted wheat crops, uh, there's often a really good demand for export hay. And if they're full of last year's cereal stubble, you, you, you miss out on that option. So I know you're never gonna um, do your whole farm for export hay, but if you've got some low lying paddocks that are regularly getting frosted, they might be ones where you remove the stubble then you can pick up some of this lower the frost risk and also have this salvage option if they get totally smoked there may be an opportunity for export hay so just one to bear in mind um, a few years back I had bad frost in narrage and a number of my clients had standing canola stubble in their wheat which meant that they couldn't uh, do export export wheat and hay positives as i touched on moisture retention uh, we know how valuable that is in your area um, soil carbon no one's paying us for that yet um, so all piss and wind and a myth anyway. Um, nice to have, but um, doesn't help you grow better crops, especially in the short term. But that soil protection one is really important. And, and you guys know you've unruled paddocks and, and you wouldn't go burning those, but there's an opportunity to reduce the stubble on some of your farm. Any comments on that? Um, one out of left field, Garen, stubble crunches. Do you, uh, they seem to be really... Flavor of the month at the moment. Yes, You've got, yep. a, got a view on those or seen some of the jobs. Uh, fantastic for canola. Yeah, so doesn't do anything for any cereal stubble. So, um, but for canola, um, really good if you, especially if you had a hybrid canola and you got a lot of biomass in bulk, and you're worried about yep. blockages and just ties and things, they do a great job of crunching that up into little chips. Um, make it very tractable and um, and work well. But in cereals, it'll flatten it and they'll just spring back up and generally doesn't chop it and break it. So there's a fit there for canola. Um, in our way, we're doing a lot of the hybrids with it. Um, and it gets rid of the wheel track. So if you're desiccated with an SP boom and you've got laid over, laid over stubble there, um, <clears throat> it chops up those wheel tracks as well. So it works well for canola, but no, it's a, I haven't seen any advantage in doing a cereal stubble with it. Yep. Yeah, and I was, Faced with um, some of my canola, I had to lift right up high because it was uh, frosted. Yes. And it was green underneath. And I was just trying to take off the top half of the crop, basically. But um, I'm considering burning just for traffic trafficability. Um, I've had probably 20 mil of rain there. So the potash should be washed some in by now. Yes. Yep. And I'll just try and do a cold burn just to try and take out the header trails, I guess. Um, any other suggestions or do I go for a ready hot red hot burn? Um. Canola burns well. Um, once you get it started, it, it does travel. Um, do you think it would work better if you chained it? Would you get more carry? Or would you just want to go through and light up the thicker parts? I just want to light up the thicker parts. I want us to leave some wind protection there. That's probably the most important yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So. Now, well, don't, if you rolled it, if you chained it or rolled it, you, it'll probably all go. So yeah. having an opportunity early evening, one night to give it a try. Yep, okay. Gen we, we find that canola stubbles really get away. You yeah. In cooler temperature. Once they light, there's a lot of oil and that, that, that burns quite well. Um, and you, know, you can burn them when it, at colder temperatures, like colder air temperatures or a bit wetter than you would a cereal. Yep. Yep. But yeah, you, you wash some of the potash out and, and the potash is in it still there. Um, yeah, so yeah, I wouldn't be stressed about it at all compared to the headache of um, block cedar every run. Yep. Yep. 
And at least the Pirates are going to left where it is rather than dragged in a five-ton lump at the end of the run. <laughs> yep. So I just think, I think uh, as a frost tool, removing stubble is a, a strategy you can use on parts of your farm um, and opportunity to save some nitrogen and pick up some of these benefits. Whereas these ones um, can be more longer term things. So getting bang for buck in 2022. So for nutrition, canola, we've touched on it, is very good at finding P. It's not called rape for nothing. So I regularly run at a couple of units of P less on my canola than my cereals. Um, you want to get the canola a bit of phosphate to get it started. But once it's up and away, it's very good at finding your history and exporting it. Um, and it's an opportunity to save a couple of units of P on the canola and maybe we're better to pull two, two units of pee off the canola in the canola year and put two more units on the wheat the year after the canola, um, where we often see some nutritional challenges growing cereals on canola. It might be better to flip it around and make the canola a bit hungrier and, and feed up the crop the following year. Lupins. Um, not sure how many lupins are growing in your area, but as a rule of thumb, um, when you have a good pea history, uh, lupins need half the, the phosphate rate compared to cereals. When you have new land that's hungry, they need more pea than cereals. But there's very little uh, wheat belt that is hungry for pea anymore. Um, that they are quite capable of taking phosphate up on your higher fixing soils, like your gravels and things. So as a rule, general rule, I usually run at you know, four or five of pea on my lupins, kind of half of what I'd use on a cereal crop. Um, so there's a real opportunity there. And, and the lupins, the new varieties are yielding well, but regularly that yield isn't linked, highly correlated with phosphate. It's highly correlated. Lupin yield is often correlated with spring rainfall and, and frost events and other things that determine how many pods they set rather than how bulky they are in the first six weeks. So, so I think lupins is another part of the system where we could really pull back on your P levels. Um, some growers have done it before and are doing it again with zero P. Um, I always like a bit of startup, but when you grow a bloody good looping crop with zero P, it gives you confidence that you could drop your rate right back um, for very little opportunity cost. So I see that as part of the system to save some money. Um, <clears throat> the other thing about lupins, uh, say for you, Andrew, with the lower K, lupins are really good at tapping into subsoil K reserves and they actually bring potash to the surface. And you can actually, if you do a lot of detailed testing, you can actually find that the, there's actually a little increase in NK levels following a lupin crop because they've brought it up from, from the subsoil. So I rarely put potash on the lupins, but I, I make sure the crop the year after has it. So. Yeah. Yep. So they're just a couple of parts of the system where we can pull some, pull some money out um, and leave on the table or, or put more into other parts of the farm. So band starter in, and if you need K, um, it's far more efficient in the furrow, and this is a good year to go with a lower rate of K and get it in the trench if you can. The, the other thing on canola and phosphate, um, we're regularly seeing uh, P toxicity with canola if you're, if you're not able to band and get that phosphate away from the seed. Um, with cereals, you always need the phosphate near the seed. Don't get distracted and put your phosphate at depth for a cereal. Always put it with the seed. But with canola, um, we're commonly seeing um, phosphate tox. For example, last year I had a client using 70 kilos of agrass on his canola to get the sulfur, and he's having trouble with the air seed, and we kept seeing these runs of really thick canola and worked out that's where the, uh, where the agrass wasn't coming out. So there's these yellow strips through the paddock, and the canola was twice as thick um, where the agrass wasn't. Um, so with the DBS system and precision planter, we really need to... Um, try and get some of that phosphate away from the seed. Does that make sense? Yep. So this is a bit of a schematic and I'm going to talk about big levers and little levers. Um, and after this slide, we'll have a two minute break because I'm going to run to the bathroom and if anyone wants to grab a tea or coffee. Um, but the big levers that we're going to talk about now in frost management going forward the number one thing, and you're gonna get sick of hearing it, but identify your phosphor prone paddocks. Everybody's had a pretty good year to do that this year and, and most of the wheat belts got too good, unfortunately. 
But what I want you to do after this workshop, if you do nothing else, is pull out a highlighter and go over your farm map and mark out where you're regularly getting smashed. I think, uh, Andrew, when I was chatting to you, you said you've got some paddocks now that have been hit three in five years. Is that right? Yeah, no, we've got sentinel paddocks on the farm that uh, if we have an event, they're the ones we go to first. Yes, yep. yep. And, and knowing they're the paddocks and doing something different on those paddocks can have a massive different, massive impact on your enterprise, um, on the whole business, just by cutting that out. Um, I had a client of Corrigan who, um, in, in, in the frost building Corrigan, regularly getting hit. Um, Sun kind of had just come home and one year they, they were frosted, went out and bought a mower and a baler and cut wheat and got his money back on the frosted wheat country. And now they have four to 600 hectares of hay in every year, which rotates through on the 25% of their farm that is, is high frost risk. And now we've really changed the risk profile of that whole business because there's 400 hectares that's gonna grow hay every year. Um, we're only growing hay and barley on those paddocks now. Um, so it's generally hay, barley, barley. We're not trying to grow other break crops. And it's really, and when they do, because they've got hay in their system, when they do get frosted, they can go and take a bit of other, other frosted grain, frost damage crop out. So by, by changing their enterprise on the worst part, it's just lifted that whole average of the business up. So then when we know where those areas are, we've got to consider what enterprise we're going to use on that area. Select the appropriate crops. So the enterprise could be you run, you might put a clover-based system in there if they're your bad, badly frosted country. And it might be that it's pasture, pasture, oats or, or whatever suits that. But then when you do crop it, we've got to make sure we have the appropriate, appropriate crops and then get them in at the right time. Um, those frost grown paddocks don't usually have to be the first paddocks in. Um, they're often lower lying, sandy surfaced, a bit more forgiving if you're a bit later. Um, and I see those four steps as being the most critical things you can do to manage it. These are smaller levers. Um, these are more the one percenters. These are the 20 percenters. So managing your stubble is useful. Uh, working out uh, how much you invest on those paddocks and where your target yield is. Just because they can grow four tonne. If they've been frosted three out of five years, maybe you should be fertilising for a tonne and a half or two tonne um, and not getting overexcited on the frosty paddocks. And then tweaking uh, some nutrition, which I'll touch on. So if it's all right with you guys, we'll have a two minute break. Yep. You, does anyone want the whole five minutes or just a short break? I've got to go find a battery charger somewhere. Right, we'll give ourselves five. <laughs> Thanks, Darren. Okay. See you in a minute.
Hello, everyone. I'm uh, back on deck. I see we've got a few more people on board. And I thought it would be a good opportunity for everyone to unmute their mic and say a quick hello. Um, there's a fair bit of expertise in the room. I see we've got Brenton Lesky, who's been nice and quiet there and hasn't disagreed with me verbally yet. Um, and I think uh, Ben Bidoff is also online. So, um, yeah, feel free to, everyone's very welcome to interject and get some discussion going. So I don't mind the least if anyone wants to butt in. And if anyone wants to put their camera on and put their pretty mug in the scene, I don't mind that either. So thanks very much. And I think we'll get started now. So I've just run through that chart, so I won't uh, dare you with that. Are we all uh, right to go? All good, Gary. Yeah, all good. <clears throat> Well, uh, um, I don't know what you guys are hearing in the pub, but you know, often if I'm out with a grower group or something after a frost event or whatever, and people bar me up and say, oh, there's, there's nothing I can do about frost. I can't stop it. I'm out of control. Wasting your time. Um, and I just thought I'd show some contrary data to that. Um, this is the trial that I did a couple of years ago in 2005. Um, <clears throat> And you guys do this every year. Um, on the left hand side is gross return. And these are different treatments, so on, on the same day. So we had Kalingari, the farmer practice. Um, we had some oats. Back then it was a feed oat variety and oats weren't worth a lot of money, but the yields are there. We had boda and barley that made malt um, with some pretty handsome yields. We had some blends of wild catchum and yidpea. Um, in 2005, it was a late frost. It was about 5th of October. So the wild catchum, the shorter season wheats, um, they were grain frosted. So really high shriveled and distorted grain, um, kind of 25 or 30 counts per black plastic measure. The, the grain looked terrible. And the longer season, the yid pea was flower frosted, so the, the, which is the opposite to what we normally see with a September frost. Um, the short season were grain distorted and the long season were flower frosted. But it doesn't really matter what the treatments are. What I want to highlight to growers is every day when they turn up during seeding and seed a paddock, they have a whole range of choices in varieties and species to plant. And the outcome uh, in a frost environment can be extremely different depending on what choice that is. And very often farmers get busy during seeding and I'm loaded up with a particular variety and oh, it's only 400 hectares, it's not worth changing out to a long season variety or after this one, I'm going onto the other farm and it's a two hour drive back. So I'm gonna seed it while I'm here um, rather than seed the frosted paddock, the high risk paddock five days or 10 days later. Um, <clears throat> as our never happens, Gary. Sorry? I said it never happens. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You never get back or you never say it? <laughs> never say it. <laughs> <laughs> and it just shows that in any one decision you make, you know, Bodan Barley, this was a 5th of May so on site, uh, yielded 3.6 tonne. And in those days, that was big money. Um, it was probably 180 bucks or something. But um, is, there's big differences every day when you roll into a paddock, what you can do. Does that make sense? So don't think you have no control. There's a lot of tools out there right now. Um, and a lot of those are old tools that you can grow on your frost prone paddocks that are gonna get a different result. Um, and a lot of those would have worked last year. Obviously, you know, <clears throat> every year is gonna be different and every frost event is gonna come at a different time. But there are tools out there now that can change your risk on frost prone paddocks. So what have we learned in the uh, recent frost events? Uh, 1998, that was my I, I, I just moved from Northern to Lake Grace. That was my first big frost event. Uh, that was a one in a hundred year frost event. <clears throat> and we had another one pretty similar in 99. And for a long run there, we kind of were getting alternate frost years with a frost every second year. And generally I find that my rule of thumb is that 40% of my clients lose 40% of their grain every second year. Um, this year, unfortunately, the frost was in your area, but um, not a lot of my clients in that patch, but generally it moves around. Um, this year was in that Meriden district and the year before was Lake Grace and Lake King were frosted and that sort of thing. So we regularly 
the, the regular events, but l luckily not hitting the same patch each time. So what have we learned over these events? Is frost often hits those farmers who are doing everything right. The guys who are on time, organized, pushing the boundaries, doing what they can to be the highest yielding farmers. And we also know that frost avoiding comes at a cost. It comes at a cost um, um, in, often in the years when you don't get the frost as well. But you need to know, because you know, some of that cost might be going past the 400 hectare frosty paddock and coming back 10 days later, it's a pain in the, pain in the backside, there's a cost to that. Um, but you need to know or have an understanding of how bad that risk is to say, is it worth leaving this paddock now and not sowing at the scepter weed on the 4th of May and come back on the 18th when I'll finish the other block? Um, once you get a handle on that risk, then you can decide how much insurance uh, you want to take out. What we've learned in the big events, 98 was a big one, 2008 was a big one, 16 was a big one, and for you guys, 2021 was a big one. What have you learned? You can't avoid them, they happen. Um, if we try too hard to not get damaged in those years, you probably would go broke slowly anyway. But with good planning, diversity, you can lower the impact on your business. And that's what this next session is going to be about. So the first one is know your risk, low, medium or high. Um, I don't know if you remember, but at the start of the talk, I had those photos showing the cold air and the amount of frost. And some of those frost affected areas were way up north on the northeastern wheat belt. Some of those guys, it might be their first frost in a generation or in 10 years. Probably the best strategy for the northeastern wheat belt, which regularly heat stress and drought is their risk, is to do what they've always done and not change much. But if you've got paddocks like Andrew commented, he knows now which paddocks are getting frosted three in five years. That's when you start sitting back and going, hold on a minute. I've actually got to do something different here. I can't afford to keep farming that area of my farm like I farm the other part of your farm. So I think you need to know that risk. Um, at a paddock scale, uh, <clears throat> using you know historic, historical data for the region, your own experience, which is obviously the most valuable. But of course, we know, you know, you can pretty much, I can drive onto farms now and, and pick where 80% um, of the frosty country is just by the position of the landscape and the soil types. And what I really want people to do is to focus on mapping high risk areas and managing them differently. And just to reiterate it, I've written it again, but if you do nothing out of this talk, if you pull out a highlighter at the end and mark those areas, it really makes a difference to how you're gonna manage them in the future. So the first thing is identify your low risk parts of your farm or areas of your farm. Your hilltops or parts of the farm that just almost never get frosted. Um, even in the frost belt, I've got clients that say, oh, that area never gets hit. So if you identify the areas that don't get frosted or have a very low risk, probably the best thing you can do is nothing different. Ignore frost, aim for maximum production. If sowing set the week on the last day of April works for you on that part of the farm, and the risk is low, go for it. Then when we go to the medium risk part of your farm, so these are areas that might get frosted one in five or one in seven years, um, whatever you think is medium risk. The key thing there is to match your time of sowing to your variety maturity. What you don't wanna do is go in crazy early with a short season wheat or barley and turn your medium risk into high risk country by having it poke your head out 10 or 14 days earlier where the probability of frost goes up. So you don't want to turn a medium risk into a high risk by risky behaviour. And I feel the biggest challenge for agriculture in WA and managing frost, the elephant in the bedroom, is matching sowing time to maturity. Throughout the central wheat belt, we've all got mates in Gerald and Esperance who are in a race for seeding and they're the first ones on Twitter that they're finished seeding by the 15th of May. And in my area, I have a bit of a line about Kung Fusha. Kung Fusha say, man who finished seeding first will probably finish harvest first too in a frosty area. It's a bit hard when you don't get to make eye contact with people when you say bad jokes. When do you seed wheat relative to your local NVT? Do any of the mad fit guys want to tell me when their NVTs go in? 
May 15th to May 25th. Is that about somewhere in there, Gary? Yeah, usually. Yep, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's about right. Yep. Yep. So between the 15th and 25th. And when's most of your week going in? First to the 10th. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what we're seeing, and uh, the other side is a year like last year, all your NVT trials, they'll be chucked out of in the bin. So you know, there's valuable data in those NVT trials. If nothing else, management data. It's not genetic, not going to genetically say that this one's more tolerant, but it's which varieties avoided it. Um, they get culled as well. So um, the problem is, is we're, we're using the stud book to pick our genetics through a different selection criteria than you're using on your farm. You're planning in the first half of May and, and we're selecting varieties that do really well on the second half of May, which are going to be awesome varieties for the end of seeding, for a drought year, for a late break year. But what do we have in our system for the first half of May when we get a year like 2021 and, and you've got great seeding conditions? And, and when you're at Meriden and you've got wet soil and it's the beginning of May, you're not going to stop and wait. So um, how are we going to manage that? Here's some data uh, using flower power. And we've got flower power. We, uh, the industry has flower power also bringing in heat now. So the blue is showing the frost risk for Bonnie Rock. And the red is showing the incidence of heat stress increasing as we head into summer. And it just shows the difference here <clears throat> with uh, sowing date early May, with septa mace flowering around that 2nd of September not far from the 3rd of September, your magic day last year, versus yip pea and cutlass flowering closer to the 10th or 12th of September at a period where the frost incidence is, is, frost incidence is declining, but being also conscious that the heat risk is increasing. And that's about trading off, how big a trade-off do you want? And that really comes down to um, how risky the paddock is. So converting that data, into a cumulative data set. So this is the scepter. So this is Ben's work. What he's done is look at the flowering date and this is cumulative. The blue is cumulative frost days and the red is cumulative heat days. Um, and he's pitched that 10 days before flowering and 10 days after flowering. So for scepter wheat, flowering in the middle here, by the, by the 10th of September when it's finished flowering, it's got an average of almost five frost days. Um, and similarly, you know, that four and a half to five heat stress days. When we have cutlass flowering 10 days later, the frost days, just over two and a half. So almost half the amount of frost days, cumulative or probability, by just flowering that 10 days later. We have seen an increase in the heat stress but the heat has gone from kind of four and a half to this point we're sitting around five and a half. So really, we've got one extra hot day by flowering 10 days later, but we've halved the number of frost days. And that can be very significant by just simply changing your variety maturity. Mm. So medium risk paddocks, match your time of sowing to your variety maturity. If you want to sow early on a medium risk paddock, use something a bit longer just to push it back that little bit to make up the window. So that could be a denison, it could be a, a cutlass, it could be even um, even rock stars that little bit longer than the sector, but it's just pushing it back a little bit on the medium risk country. Possibly on the medium risk country, widen your rotations, grow a few less risky crops. I put pulses and canola in your risky crops. Um, and barley is gonna be a safer bet on that country over time. Um, but again, it's how risky your medium is and, and um, <clears throat> how much insurance you want to take out. You want to make sure you've got at it. On, you know, sometimes a medium risk country is the, the sand plain mid slope where the potash levels could be low. Um, I'll, I'll show you some data later, but ensuring you have adequate potash um, can help um, minimize the frost damage. You can't, buy, you can't buy frost tolerance with extra potash, but if you're deficient, it appears as though you could be more vulnerable to frost. 
here's some trial work from there's been a lot of work done um Murdoch Uni, Richard Bell has done a lot of work on potash, but for me, this is a really simple trial that shows the difference with potash. This was in 2016. It was a CSBP trial at Lake Grace. Topsoil, 30 parts per million of K. Subsoil, 19. Even further down, 15. So we're talking a sand plain soil with white sand over some dark sand. 50 of N, 8 of P. Uh, the N was banded at seeding. Steve Curtin did the frost ratings, 88% sterility in the head, yielded 580 kilos. Adding just 11 of K, so 22 kilos of muriate equivalent in the furrow banded. In this case, they use K till, but you'll get the same effect with any source of K. Um, dropped sterility to 63%, but picked up an extra, um, well, over half a tonne, nearly 700 kilos of extra yield just with that little bit of potash. So what we're seeing here is that supplying enough potash to have more robust cells, maybe um, better plant relations is getting a yield increase. And there's a reason why our data, um, scientific data matching that observation. So what I want now I want to focus on, I've said the low risk parts of your farm, you're going to do nothing different. <clears throat> the medium risk kind of farm at the same, maybe a bit more barley and make sure you're not short of potash. And if you want to sow something early, make sure it's a bit longer rather than turning your medium risk into high risk by doing something a bit silly. But now we're moving on to that bit of the farm where I want you to pull your highlighter out and, and actually really stop and think and say, what can I do differently on this high risk part of my farm? Firstly, first one is enterprise. Um, you know, do you have more pasture in the system on that part of the farm? If sheep are in your system, then maybe that's where you can get your, your medics or your subclovers going and have have it in crop less frequently. But ultimately, it might be more pasture, more fodder, more hay if hay works for you. We know oats are very good at handling frost and barley is better than wheat. And on the high frost risk country, I'll be very conservative on the amount of canola, wheat and expensive pulses that you put there. Lupins, I put a question mark. Lupins get frosted. Um, these paddocks do need a break crop at some point, but they are one of the cheaper pulses to grow and we do get multiple year benefit afterwards. So I'm not against putting lupins on high frost with paddocks, purely more uh, when you have a need, um, needs driven, um, it works okay. I come from Narragin, so I'm a big fan of oats and, and I'm helping a lot of my clients in a lot of rainfall zones grow profitable oat crops. Um, agriculture has, has been looking at frost tolerance in wheat for years and hasn't gained a lot. and and maybe we need some real investment in, in drought tolerance in oats and we might get there quicker than trying to breed for frost tolerance in wheat. So a bit of a tongue-in-cheek stir, but, but um, yeah, if we had, a, had oats that were better adapted to the lower rainfall environment, that might help, um, help in your frost management tools because most of your varieties are really suited to the western areas. Um, look at your timing across your enterprise. We can't afford, especially in areas like Meriden and Nungarran, you can't afford to delay seeding. Um, that'd be crazy. So we need to structure your seeding program so you can safely seed early without ramping up your risk. Like that chart I had with the scepter and um, cutlass showing that, you know, that early head emergence is just um, doubling the frost risk. So an example, um, and I know a few of you guys have got these tools in there in your system, but if we have the early year, Having some Alibo that you can go in from the end of March or middle of March onwards, some canola, it's fine in the early April window. <clears throat> Oats are fine from mid April. Lupins are pretty flexible wherever you put them. Hay can go in late April. Now, how do we get a long season barley back in our barley system? It would be great to have a silo of barley that we can use, um, something like banks. Maybe scope, I'm not a fan of the head loss of scope, but gee, these varieties perform very well if you can get them in in late April and, and they flower later and avoid the frost more often than these short season varieties. Um, now, how much Cutlass, Valiant and Denison's out there to have some flexibility? Um, and then we finish on our shorter season, um, wheats and barley. So there's still an opportunity to structure a good seeding program that can be very heavy on early sowing when you get those years, but obviously you can still tolerate um, 
still allow you to be seeding later in the dry years. Um, I regularly comment about farmers and what's the new header costing these days, Doug, around a million bucks? Yeah, you better ask Drew that one. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> haven't haven't priced one lately, better. Darren. <laughs> But, geez, it's bloody hard to get a farmer to put a couple more silos in to store some Alibo or oats if they get an opportunity. And I reckon a silo is about 12 or 13 grand and it's about three grand for the pad. Um, but I, I think it's probably one of the failures of our <clears throat> modern system as, as agronomists. We've got very good at helping our clients plan. So we do the plan and we work out that you need 45 tonne of cutlass and you need 120 tonne of sector and you need... 33 ton of something else, and that's what gets kept. And, we, and it does take out that flexibility. And I think we need to relook at our system and, and invest in, in surplus grains um, so we have maximum flexibility when good years come like last year. Because it would have been expensive <clears throat> not to be seeding um, and grab those opportunities, but um, we just need to be seeding with the right tools. And some of that has to get back through to the breeders as well um, so we get the right tools for the system. Um, matching your inputs to realistic yield potential. So this high frost risk country often grows awesome crops and that's why hay works so well because you can grow a lot of bulk there. But doesn't mean we, you know, maybe we put a note in our plan, do not ever top up nitrogen on this paddock. You know, maybe on the high frost risk paddock, it gets a conservative hand without the top up just to manage how much money you throw at them. So I've got some trial data here. Um, this is from Borden, so obviously a long way from home for you guys, but I think the message is still very good. Um, so at Borden on high frost risk country, which down there is the river country, uh, and this is an in input trial over a number of years. So targeting two tonne, three tonne, and four tonne worth of inputs, um, pushing the seed rate up, the end rate up, pushing P and the K. Um, and then this trial is showing uh, we've got the yield in the numbers on top and it's showing gross return on the side. And the red bars is cost. And on frost prone paddocks, we're just not getting the profit. Um, we're not getting that. Now, as the response curve flattens out, like I showed at the start, um, we're just not getting economic value by pushing the yield potential up to the flatter part of the response curve on the frostier country. And when you do get a hit, you get a much bigger, fatter loss on the badly frosted stuff. So it's not always that bigger crops get frosted more. It's often just about managing your, your economics. And Or if you've got an extra 50 tonne of urea, where do you put it? Do you put it on your frosty country or do you go on your low frost risk country and put it there? How do we grow a more tolerant crop? <clears throat> So one of the things is adequate nutrition. You don't want to grow a wheat crop, um, suffering uh, potash deficiency, for example. Um, and I believe there's also a link with copper. And that's probably pretty relevant for you guys. Um, the, the symptomology of copper, um, when you have copper deficiency, you end up with wheat pollen. And it's quite likely that this wheat pollen is more vulnerable to cold events than um, than healthy, robust pollen. So on frost prone country, <clears throat> it's always useful to um, check your copper levels and make sure you've got um, adequate copper. And similarly, play a conservative hand with nitrogen. Um, the National Frost Initiative did a fair bit of nitrogen work uh, and it showed, uh, Ben may interject if I, my memory is wrong, but basically as we push the end rates up, the yield potential rose. Um, and most of the time, the percentage frost didn't. So conservatively with N, but it's not increasing your frost risk. It's just more about where you get your best bang for your buck. Yeah, so uh, we could basically increase yield potential, but we couldn't increase return basically with nitrogen. So it's a bit different to potash, whereas you increase the yield, it pays for the K, even when you do get frost with nitrogen, it doesn't. You've just got a flatter response curve, yield response curve to nitrogen. And so you just don't get the return on the investment in those really frost prone areas. It doesn't increase your crop sensitivity, but it doesn't make your crop more susceptible. It's just, it doesn't pay for itself in those really prone areas. 
So it's really about investing that fertilizer in on a safer investment, safer place at the farm. Yep. Um, grazing crops. Is there matter much uh, grazing going on in the right years? Or do we find that when you get the early break, you don't need the feed or how's it fitting? I reckon from my perspective, where there's an opportunity, Garen, in the right year, then yes, but um, often it's having sheep numbers that you can move with a, you know, predominantly an April, May lambing um, can make it a little bit tricky in that time. Yeah. I think there's an opportunity in the year like last year when you finish seeding and go, oh, shit, that was a bit quick. Um to actually strategically graze some paddocks. Um, one, you've got the option of things like early alebo and the winter wheats and those sort of setting paddocks up specifically for grazing. But yeah. um, the data says, uh, the research done says that two weeks solid grazing changing changes flowering time by one week. So it's a tool you can use on your frost growing country. Um, if you suddenly finish seeding and you've got a bit more crop in earlier than you wanted, you could strategically take out some paddocks or lock sheep into paddocks and effectively to die maturity um, and have more variability on, on that block or that farm by grazing some of it. Um, so it's a tool there to be used. Um, we know it comes with challenges about uh, opening the window and allowing weeds to get through and those sort of things, but um, we're certainly with um, post-emergent sulfur carbon and other options, we can manage that. But yep, grazing is one of the only way you can change your flowering time after seeding. And two weeks grazing, roughly, as a rule of thumb, changes grazing by one week. Uh, soil amelioration. Um, I hear Warrakiri is doing a lot of work up your way and, um, and other growers are looking at um, soil amelioration. And we're finding that that's actually quite positive for managing frost. Um, generally, I wouldn't be going out and ameliorating soils just for frost, but if you've got a non-wetting problem, um, or subsoil acidity problem and you want to speed it up and get some mixing happening. Um, uh, we're regularly finding that there's a, a positive spin-off by lowering your frost risk. Here's a photo of a paddock at the Facey Group at Wickerman or Yillering. Um, this bottom section of the paddock, so you can see it heading up the slope. The yellow area, the bottom section was mole boarded and unfrost affected in barley. So on the same day, um, <coughs> And that clear liner is the frost heading up the hill um, where, the, where the higher part of the landscape is severely frosted and the mold watered area isn't. Um, so that's some anecdotal evidence. Um, <clears throat> we've, through the National Frost Initiative, we've done some uh, mold board trials. We're picking up yield increases from mold boarding. Uh, this work's done in Corrigan, um, more than paying for itself in the first year. And deep ripping and spading, doing a similar thing further west of Brookton. And we're picking up, um, in the two years we did these trials, we didn't get any frost events, unfortunately, but we were picking up um, warmer air temperature at head height uh, during the evening, but not enough, it didn't get cold enough to measure any frost impact. Um, but Ben was, Ben bit off work with Stephen Davies from Deep Herd and helped them manage a lot of their amelioration sites. Um, and they looked at eight trials over three years that had some frost impact and assessed the impact of soil amelioration um, on frost. And what they found was when there's a light frost, um, consistently the soil ameliorated the orange curve. So consistently with a very light frost, there was a yield increase by amelioration. When there's a medium frost, it actually widened and the benefits became greater. Um, by ameliorating, you picked up some advantage. But when there's a bad frost event, amelioration isn't good enough. So it's not a bulletproof strategy. It's picking up a half degree or one degree or reducing the duration of the event, which is useful and helpful, but it's not enough to save you in a, in a really bad event. But it helps go if, you, if you've got some amelioration work you want to do a relevant frost, it's useful to know that there's an advantage. Mm. Um, any comments on that or anyone want to add any observations? All good. Um, I've touched on a bit already today, but do you need that stubble? 
on the high frost risk parts of the paddock, or sorry, on the high frost risk areas of your farm. Often that doesn't need the stubble as much. It's not the sandy soils on top of a hill. Uh, often the erosion risk is lower. And um, the other side is um, removing your canola stubble pre-wheat and barley can allow a, help, a salvage hay option. From a temperature point of view, it's now conclusive that heavy stubble burdens increase the severity of frost. Um, there were four years worth of work um, done in a range of locations uh, with a range of groups involved. And you can see the stubble rate trials applying stubble post-emergence, so it wasn't affecting the crop establishment. One tonne, two tonne, up to eight tonnes per hectare. Um, regular designs like this. And the data is consistently showing an increase in frost duration. So this is um, hours below a critical temperature. And all of these sites at uh, increased rates of stubble were colder at head height or for longer. Uh, an increased level as the frost, as the stubble load increased, there was more floral sterility or sterile flowers during that frost because it was colder for longer. And that flowed through to yield the higher, the darker blue with the high stubble loads, regularly refining um, lower yields with the higher stubble load. And the important thing for, for Meriden this year is you guys are, are carrying more stubble than you normally do. Um, a rule of thumb is that um, your stubble load should match your yield potential. So if you're thinking it's a two ton year, it's quite fine to carry around a two ton burden of stubble. But if you've got last year's where you're carrying say seven ton of stubble and you're going into a cereal crop that might be growing a two ton crop, you have a lot of stubble on the ground, which is really going to ramp up the frost risk. Um, similarly, I showed that data of the frost, uh, a trial that we uh, put in in Corrigan in 2016. Uh, as you can see, lower in the landscape, wheat surrounded by barley, um, had, some, had some pretty good data early on by the first frost. Um, and then we had multiple frost events again and basically the whole site was totally wiped out by the end of it. So again, stubble is a small lever. It's not going to um, save you in a big frost, but it's going to add useful, useful uh, temperatures or useful um, improvements in temperature during mild events. Growing a profitable crop on a frost grown paddock. So we've got a frost grown paddock. I know what it is. How do I make that profitable? First one, if oats work for you, grow oats or hay. They're safe and bulletproof or close to it. Um, barley, and if you must sow wheat, make sure it's a long season variety. But, you know, my fan, my preference for you guys would be to get into some varieties like Banks. Um, banks barley. Has anyone got Banks in your area, Doug, do you know? Uh, not that I know. Of. I've got King's Eye. That's about as long as I've got, so... Yeah. Yeah. So Banks is a barley was released about four or five years ago, provisional malt. Um, it performed quite well, but it didn't make malt. So it just got dropped by industry, but it's just a longer season, normal old. It's not emmy, but it just, it's been outperforming planet for my clients at Lake King and Hyden. Um, doesn't have the big canopy. It looks pretty ordinary, um, but we can sow it at the end of April and, and it's not rushing on. Um, and it's performing well you know, by just being that 10, 14 days long. That's a bit longer than scope. So it's 10 or 14 days longer than the Spartacus Maximus types, which lets us get it in a bit earlier and, and it's working well. Um, if you want to grow a long season variety, sorry, if you want to grow wheat on these sites, well, let's make sure it's something like a Cutlass or Valiant. And it's no harm with these longer varieties on a high risk paddock just shifting it back that little bit. So, you know, one of the farmers often say to me, you know, well, if I start with my cutlass and then I move on to my, my mid-season and then I finish my rock star and then I finish on my scepter, one will all line up. Well, on a frost grown paddock, it doesn't hurt to have a bit go in at the end that's longer. So it throws it out even further. And then Doug or Andrew will say, well, well, don't I miss out on my 40 kilos a day if I'm late and push it back? And that's right. But later sowing crops generally miss out on hundreds of kilos per hectare. So 200, 300 kilos if you're a week late. 
But what happens if you're a week early and you get more frost than you needed, you lose tonnes per hectare. And that's what we're concerned about on these higher frost risk paddocks is losing one tonne or two tonne or a tonne and a half, not whether we miss out on the last 300 kilos because, because we were um, a bit later or grew a long season week in the middle of the program. Karen, I reckon that strategy works really well. Um, as long as you've got a good rooting depth, a good soil type that can withstand that 30-day drought in September. Yes, yep. Just got to be careful that you don't have a shallow duplex or a hard setting clay that does that doesn't have a very good rooting depth and you can the crop can really fall over. Yep. Um, that's the only comment I'd make on that one. And and often those lower lying soils are quite good. You know, they, they did have the timber on it, the clearing and would that would you think? Does that fit? Um yeah, just you just be careful you don't go anywhere near your morals or anything like that. Yeah. Um yep. or well, hard setting grey really clay. Good. Yep. Yep. So Yep. Yep. Thanks, Doug. Um, and again, we can remove the stubble. That's going to give you the hay option and um, a uh, a bit warmer at head height and for a shorter period. Use conservative inputs. These often valley floor soils can grow thumping big crops, but they're also soils that give quite well. So you can grow a good crop with less and better, especially for the coming year with high input costs. Those costs are going to be better, much better put on the safer paddocks than the frosty country. Tissue test to check your potash and your trace element levels. And for more insurance, if it fits your system, you could um, have grazing on those paddocks just to delay, delay or mix up the, the uh, flowering time within the paddock. For extreme and rare events, really it's about your business, having a sound business structure with farm equity or farm investments and FMDs and, and just ha having a healthy, robust business. But I, I really believe that with good planning and a diversity, you can lower the impact of frost, even in these bad events. And I think often we just get too hung up in our system of having to finish quickly. And I want to keep it simple. So I only want a couple of varieties and, uh, and we're just giving up or ramping up our risk when, we, when we're doing that. So management for profit, pick winning bets. We still need to be aggressively early sowing. I'm not, I'm, I'm very for sowing early, it's just with the right crops. Um, <clears throat> got to capitalize on early sowing opportunities, but we've got to spread out our CD program. Regularly, when I do my planning with my clients, we have a start date, but even more importantly, we have a finish date. Because um, we see that seeding is not a race, it's a, it's a journey. Um, for a few of our workshops last year, we had Gary Lang, from Wickerpen come and talk. And Gary plans his seeding program um, week by week. So it's planned ahead. And he knows what day he's gonna finish. And if he's running ahead of schedule, he'll give the, the team time off because he doesn't want to finish ahead of time. So, so um, <clears throat> yeah, it's different ways of looking at it, but for him that, that's working very well in his foster own environment. So we do have to capitalize on early sowing opportunities We've got the ability to set, spread out our seeding program and that there's value in that diversity and flexibility. So in summary, you've got no influence on the frost, timing and severity. You can influence your exposure to any given event. Jumping back to that mapping your frost prone areas, doing it differently, getting the right varieties and the right species and the right timing. Thank you. I know we've run a, a little bit over time. I'm sorry, guys, um, but I'm very happy to hang around and keep chatting if, if people have got questions or want to chew the fat or disagree. Well, I'd be curious, um, just harping back, you're talking about that Banks yes. barley. Um, has it got any idiosyncrasies? That, like what's its harvestable height or has it got some, uh, maybe not some tolerance to some of the chemicals we use? I don't know anything about it. Uh, it's just a normal... Let's feed now. Um, it's it's really what what I like about it is its maturity. It's just a longer variety. It's not quick maturing, doesn't rush on, and and it's not a big canopy. So you know, planet looks fantastic. And you like last year, I don't see any planet in your area, but you know, in August, it's like the best barley everyone's ever seen. 
but it needs to finish. And in your area, some of our planet will just burn off too often. Whereas the bank's yeah. a bit insipid, staggers out its head. It's got a nice big long head. Um, it's not, it's not, it's a mid height. It's not a tall, um, but it's not short. Um, it's a bit of a boring barley, but it's just that kind of proper 14 days longer than the Maximus, which is what we need. Yeah. So well worth a try. It's not an outstanding barley. It's just got that maturity we need. And the breeders aren't giving us that. You know, even Commodus and uh, Laparouse, they're not really proper longs. Uh, Commodus is only two days longer than Maximus and Laparouse is another two days. We're not getting that genetic spread in our barleys like we used to have. Yeah. Well, I'm just wondering if Banks has suffered from the same issues that other long season wheats tied up with NVTs have, have suffered. Well, what's happened mm-hmm. is that um, it was released and didn't make malt. So that it wasn't a standout enough variety to do it on its own as a feed. So in the NVT window, as a feed, didn't pay enough. There's other varieties. You know, Roslyn smashed it for yield in the NVT, so it was never going to work. But yep. basically how we got onto it was a couple of clients had bulked it up, hoping to go malt, because we looked for a long, a new long. It yep. did, but they had a silo full, so we just used it up, and twice in a row, it beat all their other barley. So we've just kept growing it, but it doesn't have that big canopy. So it could be, could be useful for your system. Um, yeah. Anyway, I would love a better one. And I've spoken to Integrain about it and they don't even have any data for April sowing of it. Um, they've only got- That's what I'm talking about. Sowings, and in mid-May, it didn't do that well. Um, so I've, I even joked with them and said they could actually give it a new name and do a few more trials and re-release it as a feed. But <laughs> April sowing feed option for the wheat belt or something. But yeah. But it could well be worth a, worth a look if you're trying to get some uh, barley you can plant a bit earlier. It'd be good to see a, um, a you know, an early sown barley NVT in our part of, or in the Meriden part of the world, I reckon, Garen, for exactly that reason, to show the, you know, the fit for something like banks. You know, I've got clients using scope in that space and for us, it um, hands down beats, you, you know, your... Uh, your other shorter maturity. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a lot of clients just grow scope, but the head loss is really the only thing that scares me with scope. Um, but 100 you're limited to, by, to how many hectares you grow by head of capacity. Yes, that's right. Yeah. But we just need something in that maturity, and, and scope doesn't rush on. So if you put it in on the 25th of April, it's, it doesn't bolt. Um, Magic. The, the other thing to be really cautious of is the the long season types like a denison or a cutlass. Um, if you plant them, bef- their, their um, day length trigger um, only works if they're planted after the 25th of April. So they're, they're, they work very well in that late April window. Um, if you plant them prior to the 25th of April, they get their day length trigger as a seedling and they rush on, so they'll actually bolt. So if you go in the 15th of April with Cutlass or Denison, um, it won't have its day length trigger. It's already triggered as a seedling, and it won't get it, it doesn't need it to rush into re- reproductive phase. So be very careful going crazy early with the long season wheats, because uh, I was chatting to Dion Nickel the other day, and he said that Denison so on mid-April will actually flower before um, Spartacus, sorry, before Scepter because it doesn't have a day length trigger. But if you go the 25th of April onwards, it's nice and long and does what, what it's supposed to do. So it's quite interesting. Mm. Karen, I'll just get your thoughts on um, the shorter canolas, that, like the emus and stuff like that. Um, I guess I guess we're, we're heading towards those because there's such an exponential yield increase with them. Yes. Um, are there any out there that sort of indeterminate flowering or are the most of them are very compact and they're flowering um we don't know yet doug on the like the canola varieties are coming out that quick um certainly bonito has been one that doesn't like as always try to kick on when it could um what i haven't touched on is with canola and is really important I, i've spent a lot of time talking about weed and barley and managing your flowering time with canola, I'm happy to go as early as you can to be practical. So don't think delaying, I don't believe that delaying flowering in canola is a good 
sorry, delaying sowing in canola is a good frost strategy. You get your canola in any opportunity you can. Um, for me, that mid-April was perfect. But if you've got wet, good wet conditions as the first of April, go for it. Yeah, we're more likely to go on the first of April um, just to take that opportunity of a thunderstorm. Um, yeah. The question is really whether we go with a four season, like a four length or a three length, and yep. try and work it out from there. Well, I don't think that comes in near frost, is what I'm trying to say. Um, what we generally see is canola flower planted early or late, it generally all winds up about the same time. It's okay. not a big difference yep. in maturity. So, from a frost point of view, it's the frost that happens just before it finishes flowering. And at Meriden, most years, they're all going to run out of water together because it hasn't rained for two weeks or whatever. And it's a frost you get then right at the end that does the damage. And whether you vary your flowering, your sowing time at this end, you just, if you went early, you've got an extra half a tonne that may or may not get frost. If you went later, you're still at that 2% flowering about the same time because they've run out of water. So by any chance you get, you grab that early, early sowing yeah. opportunity. Yep. Um, yeah, the emu does look very good. Um, and it did perform well. I think the, probably the trigger to look at, if you can get these varieties over a, wet, a short year and a long year, and if they perform well in the long season and the short season, that's a good sign. Which you might be able to do that by checking the district. You now, if they perform well at Meriden and they perform well at Meckering, um, that's not a bad sign because they've been able to capitalise in the longer season at Meckering and the shorter season at Meriden sort of thing. That's a, a useful yeah. way to look at it. Um, if that makes sense. But for, I believe for canola, Mucking around with your sowing time for frost is a, is, a, is a miss. Just get it in and get the best, grow the best yield potential you can and, and run the gauntlet because they all, the most vulnerable time all narrows up very close at the end of the season. Whereas flowering um, is very different um, in cereals when you plant it, whereas the vulnerable time in canola is right at the end when you sowed in March or end of May, they're both going to be the same stage at the end of the season. Okay. But yeah, as an industry, we really I'd love to see some some more, like Danny said, the long season barley and early barley NBT. And we also just any chance you get to talk to a breeder. Put pressure on them about where's my long season. See, I'd grow yeah. more of your varieties if you had some long season in the mix. Yep. I'd definitely grow a grain oat if I could. Yep. If I could guarantee weight. That's that's my biggest challenge. Yes. So, yeah. so, but <clears throat> back onto the canola, not wanting to sidetrack it too much, but when Jackie ran all of her canola trials, time of sowing trials with different maturity lengths at Dale, we were always ready to go and assess them for frost damage. We just never got any damage. So you do get hit, but you really need that rainfall um, in on canola crops at that last, at that back end of the flowering window, like, at that back end of that susceptible window when it's past flowering and it's mainly pod fill to get the damage. And as you know, with your cereals as well, that opens up the whole window. And so you can't really manage for that very well with sowing date and maturity type too much. So I agree with Garen, like with canola, we in the house system, <clears throat> when we're basically most of our yield losses at um, end of pod fill or end of flowering, start of pod fill, it's really hard to manage it with maturity date and sowing date with canola because we just don't, that re the randomness of when we get that rain prior to the frosts, which is what's required to cause the damage in canola. And when you do get that, it widens up the window of development that's susceptible. It just doesn't make sense to, to use that as a tool to manage it in canola. Cereals definitely, but not, not the canola. And we just haven't got, we haven't got any data basically on that, but that's, what we keep observing time and time again, because essentially we can't frost canola in trials without without the rainfall. We just like we can belt it with heaps of little frost, but it just doesn't do anything in terms of the, the impact on you. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, Brenton, I I hear you. I, I can see you there. Uh, is he still there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder if um, I haven't spoken to you for a while. Where, where you're at with the ice youth adding bacteria, and is that project continuing? Uh, Manuel's probably the uh, best person to update you on that. Um, but yeah, we've 
we've applied for some funding to uh, look at that in more detail um, and look at some products that might be able to, um, yeah, reduce the prevalence of that bacteria uh, in crops. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of see how that goes uh, forward. And, um, yeah, ho hopefully if um, the application for funding goes through, um, yeah, we can put a few products to the test and see if there's anything out there that um, gives us promising results. Okay, good. What are you, Andrew? Any any uh, questions asked yet? No, I'm, I'm curious about that that bacteria one because it seems, uh, you know, it's such a holy grail, um, and it's the um, symptoms that we've been seeing over so many years, um, and that's another one in the stubble load, isn't it, Garen? Um, I imagine that makes it more prevalent. Yeah, that's right. There's also, uh, Ben can probably comment more, but there's also ice youth outing bacteria on the stubble. So yeah. with heavy stubble loads, sometimes we've seen bigger yield responses than we thought we would with the heavy stubble. And, we're, and Ben's been able to find, or his team, that there's ice youth outing bacteria on the stubble that can transfer across and add to the stem frost risk of the crops as well. So... Um, yeah, it's kind of another reason to add to the reason why you might not want a heavy stubble on a frost grown paddock. Not just the yep. temperature bit, but also hosting these bacteria. But we certainly don't need landscape burning, but um, but I think some of our frost country can handle it. So for the mad fig guys, um, we've recorded today and that's going to be put up online and a link will be sent around. And um, GRDC via GGA have arranged that anyone's welcome to call me and, and chat about frost. So people who weren't able to get on board today um, are able to watch the video and there will, there, there's um, an allowance made to my time if, if growers want to ring up and, and talk through their strategies or their management um, for that. So there'll be an email sent around um, saying that, but if you're chatting to someone or to someone you think should so-and-so should have been here today, um, feel free to tell them to ring, uh, watch the video or, um, or, and or ring me and, and have a chat. So my times as part of this project through GRDC, is, I've made some time available to talk with growers in your area and talk through their situation and, and personalise their strategies. So um, feel free to spread the word on that. Or, or no, that's great. Who you know really should have, should have been involved today. Yeah, that's great, Gary. We, um... We'll certainly be doing that. It's been most informative. I, uh, it's a shame I missed out on the first part of it, but uh, oh, that was the best bit. Too. I'll be I'll be going back and looking at it just to make sure that I didn't miss the best bit. <laughs> yeah, we might have mentioned you a few times. <laughs> oh, Doug, I know you. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, if there's no more questions, we might call it a close. But um, similarly, happy for all the people who are involved today. Happy to extend my. Um, my availability to give me a call if you want to chew the fat or, you, or uh, have a brainwave afterwards or whatever, don't hesitate and give me a call. So thank you very much. And uh, it's a real shame I uh, couldn't be in Nungaran sharing that beer with you, Doug. Is, uh, <laughs> yeah, a very frustrating times. Um, but I'm, I'm actually glad we got to deliver it because I spent half my long weekend preparing it. So um, at, least we, at least we may have a chat and, and get a system in place. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, much appreciated. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody, and um, have a good week. Thanks, Karen. Good on you, mate. All right. Yeah.